Thank you so much, TJ. Good morning. We will call this um, Monday, July 6, 2020 work session to order. And uh, again, good morning, citizens of Douglas County, and also good morning to our Board of Commissioners. Thank you for being here this morning. Before I start, I would like to call roll. I don't see it on the screen, but I do see uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, District 2, if you just respond, present. Present. Okay. Uh, Jerenia Carthen, uh, Commissioner of District 3. Present. Okay. Uh, District 1, Commissioner Henry Mitchell the Third. Present. And District 4, Commissioner Ann. Jones Guider. I, I see you, but I can't hear you. Okay. Present. <laughs> okay. Well, Sorry. No problem. Okay, no problem. So we have all our Board of Commissioners here this morning. Thank you so much. Uh, this morning I have some presentations, Board of Commissioners, but before I go into those presentations, I want to encourage you to please review the minutes for tomorrow and be prepared to uh, approve accordingly. So we'll start uh, this morning and, uh, with Dr. Meemark and Lisa Crossman. But before they start, I do have a, just five slides that I want to share with the citizens uh, as we move uh, quickly. So I will start with just the PowerPoint, and it's going to talk about briefly about just some things that want to encourage our citizens to do in terms of uh, face coverings and, and make sure that you continue to go with the uh, social distancing component and washing your hands. Just want to uh, make the citizens aware that I'm rolling out a, a, along with the Board of Commissioners, an educational campaign to reduce the coronavirus spread in Douglas County. The, the numbers are up and uh, quite sure, I'm quite sure Dr. B. Mark and Lisa Osman will share that information with our citizens this morning. The purpose of this robust campaign is to heighten awareness and educate the Douglas County citizens about the impact of adhering to the Centers of Disease CDC guidelines to help reduce the spread of coronavirus. There are three W's out there. We'd like for you to wear, a, you know, certainly recommended wear a face mask and fall, uh, or either you could use cloth face coverings. Washing your hands is very important and watch your social distancing. That is so important as we go forward. Next, uh, the next slide is, um, we'll talk about it's only five and I certainly don't want to steal our Dr. Thunders' is thunder this morning. Educational campaign. As businesses and, and operations op reopen here in Douglas County, there has been an increase in the COVID-19 positive cases in Douglas County. So while testing results increases the probability of the positive test, there's an evidence, uh, there's evidence of community spread. And Dr. Meemark will highlight that um, in a few minutes. Since the reopening of the, of the county, there has been a noticeable decline in people wearing claw, uh, masks or either claw face coverings. So um, certainly that's something we just highly recommending and encouraging our citizens to just uh, please participate in this movement as we try to reduce the spread of COVID-19 in Douglas County and also not only here, but in the state of Georgia and all across this globe. CDC uh, has a scientific study out there that indicates that uh, cloth face coverings are one of the most effective means of reducing the spread of coronavirus. Certainly encouraging the, those uh, citizens that are under two years old. Uh, certainly uh, CDC do not require that you wear a mask. And also those uh, citizens who have trouble breathing, unconscious, incapacit incapacitated or otherwise, Bob, just have difficulty um, removing your coverings. Is now yeah. joining. The risk and inaction of wearing face coverings are really high and potentially likely fatal for elderly uh, persons and individuals with serious underlying conditions. Underlying conditions. Scientific uh, evidence reveals that a substantial number of citizens still can contract the virus by just by showing symptoms, and they could be certainly asymptomatic, but you can certainly uh, contract it by somebody just simply speaking coughing or sneezing on you as a citizen. And then our, our fourth slide is the campaign is centered yes. around the importance of wearing masks and cloth. is now joining. Cloth face coverings during this pandemic. CDC is recommending face coverings okay. be worn in public settings. And again, citizens and board of commissioners and our entire uh, government uh, employee staff, this is a unified fight and we cannot take this virus lightly because if we do, the virus will take us. I encourage you to find a face, uh, find a mask or a face covering that fits properly and feel comfortable. It's so important that your masks are comfortable. Certainly as a person who has worked in surgery, uh, extensive um, 
time of her life. I understand it's like a shoe. A mask is similar to a shoe. If it does not fit, it's uncomfortable, and it really can be very agitating. So I encourage you to find a mask that fit and encourage you to wear it when you're in public. And my last slide would just highlight the, camp the components of the campaign. And thank you, uh, Board of Commissioners, for joining me with this campaign. The campaign, you will see billboards throughout our entire county, citizens indicating, please wear your face mask and also social distancing distance and also your hand washing. Facebook advertisements, we have some of those already rolling out. Thank you so much, our communications department. Our public safety announcements, uh, we have uh, one that will be, uh, we have a, a, an announcement coming out through Comcast very soon on various channels. So citizens and Board of Commissioners, you will see a commercial very soon. Flashing variable lights and message boards will be out through the county. Community emails and social media, we're working very hard. You will see some bold signage throughout our county. Magnetic uh, bumper stickers, encouraging those when you're sitting in, in the, uh, I call it in traffic and you look and you notice that, oops, I may have forgotten my mask. And full page ads in the Douglas County media outlets throughout our entire county. Rotating mes messaging on our Connect Douglas buses. And finally, our weekly news report, uh, our DC communication department team. And I believe we are heading into our 14th weekly report. Uh, so we have uh, had 14 weeks of reports from our communication department. And then also we have extensive information that is being continually rolled out from our department. So again, citizens of Douglas County, and we, we wanna take this matter very serious. So I encourage you, all of us to protect ourselves and also our fellow citizens. With that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Meemark and Lisa Crossman and as soon as possible. So at this particular time, I will turn this over to Dr. Meatmark and Lisa Crossman. Good morning, um, Madam Chair, and thank you for having us today. And um, thank you to the Board of Commissioners for allowing us to give this update today. Um, we do have a slide deck. I hope they can pull them up, but otherwise we can pull them up if uh, we need to. I wasn't sure if they received them or not. Why don't you go ahead, Dr. Meemark? I think it had been delayed getting over to. Okay, so it's stuck in, stuck in our um, firewall. It looks like it. Okay, let me let me pull up um, and make sure I got the right one. Okay, all right, all right. Let me see if I can share. And. Okay, that's good. Oops, sorry. All right. Can everybody see that? Did it pull up? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so here's our update today. So when you look um, as of July 5th, our positive cases, these are Georgia numbers, and you know that we have that um, little bit of a delay over in the um, on the right side that shows the two weeks that um, all the numbers quite aren't in yet. But you can definitely see how, you know, uh, I've been asked all kinds of questions about whether this is a second wave or anything like that. I, I don't think we actually came off of the first wave that much. So we had a little bit of a dip and then you can see how we our trajectory trajectory is really just straight up right now. Um, but the good thing is, is that the number of deaths um, really has not um, 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 you know, shown um, that same trajectory. But, um, you know, it could be because they're younger people. It could be a delay that um, um, after the cases arrive, you can see the deaths will follow um, later. Um, right now, we're, we're not quite sure, but um, uh, right now it does seem to be younger patients that seem to be admitted um, at this time. When you look at our cases here in Douglas County, you can see how we have about 1,100 cases in Douglas, but you can see the activity in some of the surrounding counties, and, and especially in Fulton and DeKalb, you can see that um, there's definitely a lot of cases that are in the surrounding counties. When we look at this timeline, let me just pull that up for you. Um, we can see back in March how um, on the 27th, we had Douglas as shelter in place. And we're really thankful to you all because um, you're always ahead of the game in, in what um, we've been doing as related to, related to COVID efforts. And we're extremely grateful for that. Um, but you can see how the cases have continued to rise. And then we got to, um, you know, back in June, just a month ago, we had 594 cases. And we mentioned that we have over 1,100 cases on July 5th. 
here are our current conditions. We've talked about the um, number of cases that we have. The hospitalizations of those cases is um, about 198, and deaths um, were 36. And uh, of those deaths, um, 19 were in long-term care facilities. Currently, there are seven outbreaks in uh, Douglas County that includes um, long-term care facilities, churches, and businesses. We continue to see that number increase. Um, if there are seven in um, Douglas, um, uh, we have, I think, about 75, 80 um, total outbreaks in the district. So there's a lot of activity going on. Um, a lot of people want to know what's going on in the hospitals. The hospitals have definitely shown an uptick. They have 21 confirmed patients right now. 14 of those are, are waiting to be ruled out, um, so not quite um, having a diagnosis of COVID-19. We have 10 patients in their ICU bed. Six of those are positive and two are waiting. And we have seven bed beds that are available um, in, for ICU in Douglas. And this is just the Douglas, uh, Wellstar Douglas Hospital. Um, and on the 29th of June, we saw the highest one-day number of um, patients that had COVID-related syndromes that came to the emergency department. When you go to our website, you can see some of the mapping of what the cases um, look like and where they're concentrated. And so it gives you a little picture and that gets updated. This is a, this is a comprehensive view um, of what we've, what we've had. And then here you can see the, the number of cases rise. And um, as you see, you know, you can see all the ups and downs that go about, but you can definitely see the increase in the trend here. And what is concerning to me is that the positivity rate has been um, as high as 14%. Now, we have gotten that number down below 3%. So of all people, if 100 people came to the drive through testing site, um, only 3% came back positive. Now, out of 100 people, 14 are coming back positive. So that tells you a little bit about the transmission um, and spread throughout the community. We're seeing something similar in, in Cobb County as well. And you see throughout Georgia, there are many pockets that are seeing this. Um, here's the age cases, but when you look back in April, you can see that um, we had more of a um, kind of bell-shaped curve of, of people that were being diagnosed um, with COVID. Now we have a lot more younger people. So you see it's weighted a little bit heavily on this side, and the hospitalizations do look to um, also mirror that a little bit. A lot more people in their 20s and 30s and 40s are being hospitalized, but we do still have people in their 50s and 60s as well. There's slightly more females and males, um, but we do have more females that are being tested. And um, slightly more blacks and whites that are um, being diagnosed. All right, so the solutions that we have, um, we continue to request um, that the medically fragile continue to shelter in place. So um, of the, the um, deaths that we have had, um, when I look at the deaths, only four out of those um, 36 um, had no underlying conditions. So that gives you an idea. It's close to 90% uh, um, that do have some sort of underlying condition. Social distancing, everybody needs to social distance. When we, we give you a call as a contact tracer, um, we really would like you to tell us that you did not have contact within six feet for 15 minutes with somebody. Because that person, um, if you come back positive, that person is now exposed and now has to be quarantined. That's my goal, is to make sure that we don't get people that are within six feet. Wear your cloth um, face cover coverings. Lisa will talk um, a little bit about some of the evidence that we have when you um, have that. But if you, I mean, we recommend that you try to wear them at all times. You don't know when you're going to come in contact with somebody. So if you're um, around people, um, go ahead and, and wear your face coverings, especially if you're within six feet. If you are sick, please, you have to stay home. The symptoms of COVID vary from um, sore throat um, straight up to chills and um, fevers. And um, what, the, what we've seen of hospitalizations is fever seems to be one of the highest indicators of, of people that are in the hospital had um, fevers. Make sure you cover your cough and sneezes. We do that in the elbow now. Wash your hands all the time. 
get tested and isolate if you're positive. And so um, this is a great time to bring up um, this whole thing about the false positives. That is not a thing. False negatives are much more of an issue than false positives. If you are positive, you are positive. You must isolate and we have to find the people that you expose. Um, the, it, you know, the tests right now pick up the genetic fragments and um, having a false positive is very rare. Respond to your contact tracers, please. If you receive a call from the Department of Public Health, um, please um, answer and help us out. This is the only way that we have to try to um, get control of, um, of the virus. And quarantine, please don't go out and out and about when you are supposed to be quarantining. So be kind to others, to yourself in such a difficult time. Um, this, is, um, this is a very, very difficult time. And so we, the only way that we're gonna beat this is if we all do it together. Honestly, it, it just can't be um, just certain segments of people that, that do it. And we need everybody to, to help out right now. Lisa's gonna talk a little bit about um, the test. Oh, wait, I'll talk about the testing, sorry, Lisa. So um, we continue to have testing and so um, there is no charge. You do not need a doctor's referral. There is no charge. You just need to go on our website and sign up. I know there's been a little bit of difficulty in getting space. We have tripled our capacity for Douglas County at our testing site, and that still seems to not be enough. And so um, right now, at this very moment, they are looking for ways to further expand that site over at Douglas Public Health and try to make a second lane there. Um, we've been really constricted with locations. Um, we've also partnered with a Metro Atlanta Ambulance Service and the the Wellstar Health System to offer some satellite testing. So they are going to be going to New Mountain Top um, Baptist Church as well as American Legion um, and um, Vision Concept. And we're working on we are working on another um, now exiting another partner to help us to do um, outreach testing and maybe some pop up testing sites because it has um, quickly outstripped our capacity to do this. Is now joining. Talk a little bit about cloth face masks. Good morning, everyone. So one more addition uh, before I move into face mask, I just wanna reinforce what Dr. Meemark said about making sure to get tested um, and to isolate if you're positive. We are hearing about a number of people who get tested are positive and then because they might still be asymptomatic or not feeling sick, they're continuing to go about their life. And so that's a real concern um, because they're their carriers and passing it along to other people. And so we need to really reinforce to folks that if you get tested and you're positive, it's important to isolate for the time that CDC recommends. If you are identified as a direct contact, we also need you to quarantine for the recommended time. That's, that's one of the few things that we have in order to box this virus in and be able to uh, get on top of it. All right, one of the other tools that we have is the cloth face coverings. There's a lot of questions about this and, and the research really is, um, it is very solid about the benefits of the cloth face coverings um, as a simple barrier. The idea is that when I, if I'm positive, whether I'm having symptoms or not, if I am positive for COVID-19, that the way that I'm transmitting that is through respiratory droplets, either when I'm speaking, uh, coughing, sneezing, singing, laughing, that those respiratory droplets are gonna come out and they're gonna land on someone else, on their hands that they then wipe their eyes with or eat and put their fingers in their mouth, um, that it's on a surface and then I touch the surface and do that. And so the idea of a cloth face covering is that it keeps my respiratory droplets against me and it keeps them from transmitting out to someone else. And so it's really one of the few tools that we have in order to combat this virus. So we're strongly recommending that when you uh, go out in public that you wear these. Um, next. Um, so, We've put a link on this slide deck and we'll make this available, Rick, through so other folks can link this. This uh, emerging evidence links over to CDC's website about the cloth face coverings and the studies that are being done. Basically, it's showing that when I cough and I don't have, um, and I don't have any covering on my face, that those droplets are 
um, spewing out, uh, just keep that in your mind as a frame of reference, that those droplets are spewing out um, several feet onto other people. And what we're seeing is that if you can have a cloth face mask, it doesn't completely protect you, right? This cloth face mask is only doing a little bit to protect me from getting COVID because I can still move it and eat and put my fingers in my mouth or rub my eyes, things like that. But the benefit is to the people around you um, and keeping those droplets from being spread. Next. So the reason that you're hearing both things, you're hearing the social distancing and the use of cloth face masks is that we have very few tools in our arsenal to fight this virus. One of them is to get tested and to know your status and then to be able to isolate or quarantine appropriately. The other is that um, by wearing a cloth face mask that I can then reduce the um, impact to somebody else. These are two um, uh, models that to help um, explain this. So you can see that um, if I am in this first column of asymptomatic or symptomatic, if I have uh, COVID, if I'm positive for COVID, and then I don't wear a face covering and another person nearby me doesn't wear a face covering, then the chance of transmission is tremendously high. That's maximum exposure. But then as you go down that list, you can see that if um, my, my risk of transmission of the virus is very low or is low if we are both wearing cloth face mask and then very low if we're wearing mask and also six feet apart. Um, there's of course no risk if I stay in my house and the other person stays in their house, but we're assuming that people are wanting to be able to get out and about. And so this is a way that we're able to expand um, and do business, community, can continue to do business in the community while also um, making sure to reduce the risk of transmission. So we really thank the commissioners for being able to support this campaign um, out in the community. Thank you, uh, Chairman Robinson, and so, or uh, uh, Jackson Jones, excuse me. And we appreciate being able to have the residents of Douglas County um, come together and do their part. I think that if we all do this, we'll be able to um, get in front of this virus because right now we're just seeing a spike and it's we're not in front of it at all. Pictures that you see here, we just thought we'd share some of them with you. Um, these are pictures of our public health staff at our public health centers and at our testing sites. Um, you can see that we all are wearing masks at every point that we're ever in contact with other folks. Um, and so if you come into our locations, we do ask that you wear a mask and that you will see our staff wearing them as well. And then on a final note, if we have nonprofits in the community that are having trouble getting masks, we have those available and can make those uh, and get those out to you. I think uh, just the other day, we got some out to the library systems um, and to the city and county government. So we're happy to provide those as well. Dr. Meemark, anything else you want to add about the masks? No, um, no, we don't have a whole lot of things that we can do to combat this. And um, unfortunately, it, it seems like it's just masks and, and being able to distance a bit. Um, those are really the, the best weapons that we have right now. Dr. Jackson Jones, anything else you want to add? I know that um, this ties in with your mask campaign. And so, um, again, we're really appreciative of the support and your influence on this. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Meemark, and also Lisa for being here this morning to uh, certainly impress upon our citizens the importance of our face coverings and all the things to social distancing and the continued hand washing. washing. This is certainly an effort on all of our parts. And I'm just uh, so um, optimistic that our citizens will uh, take heed and listen and uh, try to help with uh, fight this war. Again, I mentioned earlier in, in the, I call it before the campaign was, this is a marathon and certainly not a sprint. So we have a ways to go. I know a vaccine is certainly, uh, is it on the horizon right now? Have we heard anything? If you all could give us an update about a potential vaccine or what's going on with that, um, Dr. Meemark. 
Um, our understanding is that um, there have been a few that are entering phase three trial. Is now exiting. And there's, um, it's optimistic that we will have something by the end of the year, but, um, you know, um, really, that's quite a while. <laughs> so, uh, and, um, and, you know, and, and we're not sure how effective it will be um, at that point. So right now it's really early in the game. And, and I don't think that, I don't think we should be kind of living right now for the vaccine, but do everything we can in the meantime until we can get there. And that will just be kind of gravy on top to protect us some more. Okay. And certainly before I yield to the Board of Commissioners, I'm quite sure they have some questions. Certainly, if you could share with us about the antibody testing that allows, you know, to see who's been exposed and who's not. Can you share about that? Is that coming uh, on the horizon for Douglas County and other counties in the future? Well, you know, there, there's a lot of that happening right now, but there's also a lot of questions as to what that means. And so, um, you know, and the, the quality and validity of those tests are still kind of in question right now. So um, we don't know how long antibodies last. There has been some reports that it only lasts a few months. And then we also don't um, know how much protection it um, it gives to everybody. And so um, there's a lot of question marks on that. Um, it seems like mostly private folks are the ones that are offering the antibody test. Um, if the science um, confirms um, um, you know, the protection with the antibodies, I'm sure that um, DPH will get involved with that now. But right now they're kind of doing just some surveillance, you know, testing and um, just to get an idea of, of who has antibodies at this point. Yes, certainly the science and data uh, is very important. And with that being said, I'm going to yield to my Board of Commissioners to see if they have any questions. Any questions, Board of Commissioners, this morning? Yes, uh, Commissioner Guider, yes. I saw Commissioner Guider's hand in. Vice Chairman, I'll come back to you. Commissioner Guider. All right, thank you. Now, be uh, brief. Um, uh, the tracking that y'all are doing, uh, it, is there any common denominator as to where the spread is happening? I know a lot of uh, our young people are going to Six Flags. They're also um, working at Six Flags. And uh, I don't know if they are taking public transportation. I'm just wondering, is there any kind of... Uh, common denominator that shows how or where it is spreading? That's a, that's a great question. Um, right now, um, um, what we're seeing is just younger people. And so um, our assumption is that it's probably from people congregating somewhere, whether it was, you know, parties and celebrations or if they attended the protest or somewhere where, where groups of people will be coming together and they're out and about. So the younger folks of the 20s and 30s and 40 year olds that we're seeing. Um, but right now, I mean, we're not seeing any other um, true pockets. There's a lot of business activity. And so you can see anybody that gets it, if they had a job, that that's going to be associated. But um, Six Flags just recently opened, and, and they have taken a lot of precautions to do their best out there. Um, but I don't think we've heard anything about that yet. Yeah, I was just going to add to that, Commissioner. We, had, um, we worked for several weeks with Six Flags, and they worked with their national office to make sure that they could do everything they could to open safely. They've reduce capacity dramatically. They have are doing temperature checks and requiring masks being worn. Um, all of their rides require seats between individuals. Um, and we haven't seen an outbreak that's tied to Six Flags um, at all yet. So I wouldn't say that even though that makes you go, hmm, and, and we're watching it real closely too, that's, we're seeing it all over. And as Dr. Meemark said, it seems to be more related to all of the gatherings that started happening around Memorial Day and then continued after that. I think that we just kind of got complacent. We all got excited about uh, Memorial Day and being back in the summer and school being out uh, formally, that folks started to let their guard down. And so with all the businesses opening, with families getting together, with um, church services starting to open, we're not seeing any particular area where we would identify that as an outbreak. We're just truly seeing um, wide community transmission now. And one last question. Uh, are you keeping up with the asystematic uh, people that um, have the virus, but they're, um, they, they have no symptoms? Yeah. So uh, Any what percentage is what percentage of the numbers that you gave us earlier are asystematic? 
Um, some of the numbers that we've seen see, see uh, probably about 30% that are asymptomatic. Um, and all of those, anybody that comes back with a positive test will eventually get called by public health. Um, but once you get that result, um, it may take a few days for us to get to you because of the increase in the numbers. And so everybody is given instructions to isolate at home and um, await our call. Um, and, and we'll um, kind of help you out from there. Wow. As, as Dr. Meemark said, that with up to 30% of the people being asymptomatic, um, you know, that means that a lot of folks are walking around that don't feel sick, could, wouldn't be in our usual way identified to take action to stay at home, right? They could be spreading it before they even know it. And so that's why one of the main reasons we're promoting the cloth face coverings, the social distancing, um, and getting tested, because those three things together will help to reduce the possible transmission by people who are not having any symptoms. I yield back. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Commissioner Geiger. Uh, Commissioner Robinson, Vice Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, good morning. So here we are, you know, as you said, two, three months later. And I, I'm encouraged by the fact that we do now have data to help drive our decision making. I'm encouraged to hear that we have testing to see how infested our garden is. Right. Now, now we're talking. Now we're, now oh, we have sure that's an interesting that's an interesting visual that our garden is infested. <laughs> I think I'm going to use that in the future. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, so you, I'm glad we're we're good. We're good, right? So to that point, and I appreciate the maps and, and people do ask the questions. Well, where is it? And they're trying to find points of origination. Like, is it public transportation versus the church or workforce or wherever the case may be? I get, it. I, I, I get it. But he, here's my question which is simply, we did plan A, shelter in place. Did a great job. Douglas did an awesome job. I really think we did. We held our own. We're, we're not as dense as, uh, we're dense, but we're not as dense as maybe the major cities because of the population bulk. I, I get that. But here we are, this thing's spiking. Now, and I'm gonna ask, and I need y'all, the medical people to put your head on. Now, we're, gonna, we're gonna go back to the pens, like cause no harm. Uh, like, okay, so, this thing is spiking. And I don't want us to step over it like it doesn't exist or that it's going to be okay, which it will be. But how do we get ahead of this? And I, I get what we're saying by doing things such as putting on the cloths and so forth. But I, as I say, I touched so many ATMs, I had to go buy a little thing to push this stuff because it's all about touch. Yet we're spewing, but it's all about the contact. And I get that. So let me get down my three questions I've got. First question is, should we mandate? Are we at a point of mandating? I may not be able to answer that today, but the data will help determine. Um, and and, and maybe my, my Chief Spencer is like fighting a fire. How do you get ahead of it? Right? We made an assumption, and I, I guess I agree that the public perhaps we got relaxed, but it's also based on the leadership in our language. Go back to work, it's cool. Okay, the, the heat from the summer may, may, may stall some things. Like, no, we, we, we missed a couple of things. We collectively, and the messaging to the people. I, I don't wanna make this about the people, what they're not not doing. It, we have a responsibility in what we say and how seriously we say what we say, right? You, you, again, we're talking about quality of life versus life. So let's talk about this life part. My question is, should we, mandate this wearing a face mask ahead of time just get ahead of this we make a local declaration a local proclamation i get encouraging I, I get that we're already doing that we're already encouraging people you guys and i, I appreciate this campaign but i'm like uh-huh and, and so answer that that's one question i got two more and i got to yield the floor i got to keep going so any one of you should we mandate the wearing of face masks well, Commissioner, I would say, first of all, the governor's executive order um, says that we cannot be more or less strict than that executive order that goes through the 17th 
Um, I don't have that right in front of me. I think it's around the 17th. And so that's difficult um, because we we can't say to mandate. Um, you know, individual businesses could choose that, but as a county or a city municipality, um, you know, unless you're willing to go against the governor's executive order, it's spelled out very clearly in there that you can't be more or less restrictive than that. No, okay, I'm, I'm going to, that, that's fine. You don't have to labor that. Now, we, again, we won't get into federal versus state and, and all the political movement you can do to get that done in waivers. That, it, it's okay, duly noted um, about the executive order. But so then, one more time, why do we have to become the data point for the but the governor, just like with sheltering arm, we became his data point for him to declare, okay, now we're going to go ahead and shelter in place. So does, do we need to be in this place? And I'm, I'm watching how we message to the public, both at the state and the local levels. And I'm like, uh-huh. Right? So my second question is, okay, since we're not going to do that, which brings me to the business community, which is, uh, I don't want to blame the young people. I don't want to blame segments of the population. I, I think that there's something about our businesses that, um, that what did you tell me? Last time we talked, uh, Lisa, it was 200 companies that were um, at workplace something. I won't say outbreaks or whatever, but just 200 workplaces. Now it's up to 300. And 70, what, 78, 70, 70 odd, some number of those, 70 plus companies um, have more than two people. Right? And I'm, I'm like, okay, so what is public health? doing regarding the businesses. Because that's the place that you know, the 20 to 40 olds, they gotta go to work. They're not the 50 plus, they got retirement packages and everything else that who could sort of just kick it. They, they gotta grind. They gotta get out there. And it's not all just about hanging out. It's not just about us socially getting together. Like, no, we gotta come in contact with people. We're social creatures by default, but we are humans. And I, and I wanna be careful that we don't paint the wrong picture about the seriousness of this. So my question becomes, and this is a serious topic, what are we doing to hold the standard with the business community? Like I can go in a, in a restaurant right now in my district and say, okay, they ain't got no face masks on, no gloves, and they're serving food. And then people come, and I'm like, uh-huh. Now that's just one incident, it's anecdotal. It just becomes a story, but what are we doing? I know we gave immunity to businesses not to be sued if something happens in there. Well, since you don't get to get sued, you need to be absorbing that increased cost to make sure that place is clean that you're holding a standard. So what are you doing, public health, to help block the people? In other words, okay, sure, we as the Board of Commissioners can't override the governor. All right, we know that. We're not going to get in trouble for that. Fine. But you have the power because you are that. What are you going to do to mandate that part? And I got one more question after that. Okay, so let's see if I can hit a few points maybe that would answer your question. First of all, in that same governor's executive order that I referenced, the current one that's in place right now, it, it's a 40-page document that gives guidance to every type of business in the county, in the state, for how they need to run their business. So there may be 30 different restrictions or guidelines for a restaurant or an essential business uh, or a day camp to be able to continue to be open, they must do this and this and this and this. And so if they are not doing those things, individuals, and we don't always know if they're not doing it or if they're not doing it consistently. But for example, the restaurant that you just um, identified, there, there are some uh, responsibilities on the restaurant owner and also on the patrons, right, for to reduce this spread. So the restaurant is guided by that executive order in addition to their normal um, food service and their environmental health requirements. If somebody sees that that restaurant is not uh, being compliant with those guidelines, they certainly can email through our website or call us and we will have an environmentalist go out and make sure that they understand what they need to do. If someone sees another type of a business, and I, I can tell you we're getting these calls every week, and we're either contacting those businesses by phone or by Zoom, or we're actually going out to visit them and reviewing those executive orders uh, and those guidelines that they need to follow. On the other side of that, I will also say that I think as, as the average resident, we need to take some responsibility for making sure that we don't 
um, continue to transmit the virus when we go into those businesses. So it's one thing that uh, my daughter, who's a server, right, at a restaurant, that she's required to wear a face mask and use hand sanitizer and wash hands, and they've moved their tables six feet apart. And so that, as a server, she's following those guidelines. But I will tell you that the reports that we hear are that the patrons going into those places aren't even um, thinking about wearing a mask in some cases. And so we realize that you certainly can't wear a mask while you're eating or drinking, um, but you can wear a mask when you first enter. You can wear a mask when you go into a retail shop, into a small business. And so what if we all took responsibility and said, let me do my part when I'm a shopper or a patron to wear a mask to protect those workers and those other patrons around me and then what if we also hold those businesses to that executive order standard and, and make sure that they're doing what they need? I think that would go a long way to really reducing transmission. All right, and I and I'll, I'll yield, and I appreciate, um, obviously, Independence Day as my last question, and freedom. Uh, freedom of citizens that, you know, don't want to be ordered, don't want to be told what to do. Uh, you know, this is my life, this is et cetera, et cetera. And I appreciate also the other side of that, which is, you know, individual responsibility and sometimes just education. You know, sometimes we get into um, selfishness as, as humanity. We only think about ourselves. And, and, and I get it. I, I get American society quite well. Uh, I appreciate that. But therein lies the, with that freedom comes a certain responsibility. Uh, and if there's no implications for our actions, uh, it, it, it has a, a broader societal drag. And so I'm still back to, while wow, we're, we're trying to make these things coexist, and I'm acknowledging what's being done. You're trying to balance both. So this is not, my heart is not critical. It's like, okay, you got to do both. You, you got to drive, you got to get the economics. You cannot, yeah, get life versus quality of life, but you, it's both, right? So we're trying to balance this. But, and you're right, there does need to be some degree of, um, uh, uh, participation from the citizens, but I don't want to do it that way. Now that exposes the whole tribe, the whole county, right? The whole nation, right? And so there's, there's a, I appreciate that I'm shared in this education, which I know is going to go longer than just a couple of months, but this is, we're talking about behavioral changes, right? And, and it, it only when it hits you home that sometimes you wake up. But I, I, I'm encouraging all citizens who listen to this to, to, to think about just do your part uh, to try to do that. And so my, my last question is, uh, do we ever think that, uh, what, what is the tipping point though? And I'm looking at the slope and I'm looking at the data. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm that guy in the corner looking at this slope and intercept. At what point do you declare that we need to go to the next stage of like, okay, you know, a code orange. I don't know what the codes are. I don't even think there are some, but at, at what point when, when for Douglas, because we got to talk about what we're looking at. We, we don't want to deal the citizens their hand, like let them go along with us, educate them like, okay, what are y'all looking at? Y'all see the slope, right? This thing is hot, right? And, and so part of it is, is getting ahead of it that we all getting out there and we're putting out the sandbags. We're helping, you know, Chief Spencer, I'm sure he could speak to like, we're trying to cut off this wildfire. And so what are we looking at by way of how many more days do you think that we've got this rising 100 point, 10% increase or 100 uh, person pop do we get to like, we go to the next level? That's my last question. I have to yield the floor after that. Your answer, I yield after that, but I'm sure after they respond. Thank you. So if you um, all remember when we first started before the pandemic and we were going through all of this, um, I, I think things are, are similar, but we have some additional knowledge now um, looking at things. And so um, probably, one of the more frightening things is when we run out of hospital beds, and we've talked about that before. And so they do have surge plans in place, but once all the metro hospitals are filled and we don't have any space to take care of people, regardless of why you come in, obviously that is a, a serious concern. And so that is something that we watch very closely. Um, the hospitals have done phenomenal jobs and they do have a few quivers in there uh, arrows in their quiver to um, to to help things if we need to. Um, I think one of the other things too is when we look at you know just society as a whole, and there are certain things that um, 
we know we need to continue to thrive, right? To economically and life, people need to work. We know that, right? How do we do that the most safely we, as we can? And what are those things that we need? We need schools to be open too, right? Like we, we, we do know that we need our, our children to be educated and to be taken care of so that we can continue to um, economically drive our, our um, economies. And so those are some of the things. So as you know, we we continue to um, go with this. We have to take a look at will schools be safely able to open? Right now, we're looking okay, but those numbers it's been drastic changes just over the last few weeks. And so, I, I hate for us to get to that. You know, one of the only things that we can do is we can we need we know we need to go out. You're right, Commissioner Robinson. We have to go out and about. We are human beings. We have sheltered already, and we made our sacrifices. And we have to go out and we have to put food on our tables. Right? We have to do these things, but. We also, we really need to do it just as safely as possible because it's not just, you know, you getting sick. So it's you getting a whole bunch of other people potentially sick without even knowing it. And I know that most people would not do that intentionally, right? But if we don't wear our masks and stay away from each other, then, you know, at least six feet, then we can unintentionally be infecting a lot of people. And so those are the things that, you know, it's, and it's not much, I, I admit, if, you know, having a vaccine would be great, but once again, it's all we, we have, but we already know that we have made some very severe sacrifices. And so I think compared to what we've already been to, it's a small thing to ask going forward that we can please try our best. You know, we have to do what we gotta do, but we gotta do it as safely as we possibly can. Sufficient enough, I have to yield the floor. Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you so much, Vice Chairman Robinson, and thank you so much, Dr. Meemark and Dr. I mean, and Lisa. Uh, Board of Commissioners, any other questions from uh, Commissioner Mitchell? I see you. Up. Yes, yes. I, I just got a couple. I, I'll, I'll be brief. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you guys for a job well done and trying to get your arms around this whole pandemic. But my first question, though, as we did a food drive, Tarina and myself, uh, this past Friday, <clears throat> this past Friday, and I know the timing was a little bit bad on the mere fact of the holidays and all that kind of good stuff. Where are we going to have, I mean, it looks like we got to get out there and do a lot more testing to get a lot further ahead of this thing. And even we test today and, and, and somebody go out and get uh, contact of some sort tomorrow. Can't totally control it. But are we looking at trying to add, I know, I think I saw in your, your layout, there's like four or five testing sites or some sort in Douglas County now, correct? Yes. Are we able as commissioners in our districts periodically add some sites that will be hopefully conducive to you guys' timing? And I don't know, it just, it won't be convenient, I guess, as like this past, uh, this past Friday. But are we looking at doing that or is that something that we can kind of anticipate? Absolutely. We we welcome your um, input because you all know the community is the best. And so um, the Douglas Health Center will go to capacity with testing, but we are looking to do outreach in other communities that it may be hard to, for them to come get tested and we need to increase capacity. So Lisa and I today will be working on um, another partnership. So we do have the two partnerships and we have one more where we're trying to do it um, maybe at least one day a week, possibly two, where they'll come out to different sites and test several hundred people. We just got to make sure that but logistically, so if you have some size, please let me and Lisa know and we will put it on our list um, because as this rolls um, a little quicker, we'll definitely um, uh, be able to do some of that. But we appreciate your help in that. Yes. So, so and, to add to that though, do you got, I'm sorry, Lisa, you want to add to that, I guess? Yeah, Commissioner, I just want to tell you, so we have an outreach coordinator who's helping to secure these locations and work out the details. Um, and then, as Dr. Meemark said, we have the partnership uh, where we'll use our own staff, Metro Atlanta Ambulance Paramedics, and also the Wellstar Congregational Nurses. Um, and then we're working on a third, I mean, a, yes, a third partner. And so just what we'd like to see are, I don't want to dilute folks who could come to our Selman Drive location at our public mm -hmm. health center. So we'd like to be able to set up locations that might not be real close to that location um, and also where we could have 35 or more people that could be registered for testing 
it's it's not terribly efficient uh, an efficient use of our staff to go out for just eight or ten people um, so we would like to see the volume be able to be served well with the food drive that Commissioner Carthen and I did you had about 200 plus uh, just FYI okay. uh, so the other thing so the um, the offering of masks throughout the county how it how is that how do we get access to that? How do the citizens get access to that? Or is it at a particular place? Or should we put it at all churches? And I mean, this do you have enough masks to go around? So we've given, uh, we just got a shipment of about 100,000 masks Good. for our district, which keep in mind, our district is about 900,000 people. So it doesn't completely cover everybody. But what we've been trying to do is to provide those out to our nonprofits um, and folks who might need them um, for their congregations or for some of their nonprofit uh, clients. And so I'm happy to get those out to you. Uh, you probably the best way that residents um, can request it is through our website, the Contact Us. Um, that will get to us and then we'll be able to get them over to the Douglas uh, Public Health Center for folks to pick up. Yeah. Okay. All right. Because I, I just think most probably just don't know where to go and grab them outside of it, your office or something of that caliber at a hospital, but maybe all the churches and so on. But, you know, if you're working with the 501c3, that's that's a good choice. Right. Now, so the other day I gave, I gave 500 to a local church that they had a large congregation. And so mm -hmm. we gave them 500 and they're going to get them out to their congregation. And that's a great solution. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that that's great. But I just want to make sure that those that are watching the program and listening to this know kind of where they can go and grab them, whether it's a church or any other 501c3, so they can kind of get access to those. My other question, though, is, OK, are we anticipating I mean, we're already at a peak with this virus and this is now the summer? But from my understanding, I thought we were anticipating a peak somewhere now about the fall or the winter. Are we anticipating a double whammy here or or, or not? Or am I off keel because I'm not the medical expert? Well, <laughs> your <laughs> guess is going to be as good as mine. I anticipate that with cooler weather, we should see more cases is, is kind of logically what you would anticipate. And then we throw our seasonal flu on top of that. And right. so and that may muddy the waters a little bit for us um, unless something truly miraculous happens between now and, and oh my gosh, September is right around the corner, um, then um, I anticipate we would, and, and we really haven't reached the peak yet. We just continue to just rise in cases, so. Right, so, so we don't really know the answer to that question. No, guess. we don't, but I hope a miracle comes. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe the cure will be in, in, in time for that though. And my last question, you know, the misnomer is, at least for some, wearing the mask, are problematic, meaning, you know, it creates another problem for those that are wearing the mask. How are we going to kind of get them to under, get most citizens to understand that wearing the mask is really, uh, that's, I would call it a misnomer, but it may be something true to this, that wearing a mask, if you're asthmatic or anything of that caliber, that you could create another problem for yourself. Is that true, first of all? Uh, is this a, a true problem for those that are wearing the mask? to understand that it's not a problem, it's not problematic. So help me to understand and help us as citizens to understand, you know, it's better to to be proactive and wear the mask versus um, with the uh, possibility of what people are saying that the mask creates another problem for you as an individual. So I, um, you know, I don't like to use blanket um, you know, guidance for everybody. Um, there may be people that um, that feel like it is really truly intolerable to have um, the mask on that's tight fitting. And, and it could be, it's not just medical conditions, but it could be things like um, um, even having claustrophobia anxiety or something like that. But um, if you have a, a, a form of severe asthma or respiratory condition, it, it could make it a little bit more difficult. There are some other options that you could try something a little bit looser fitting. I know it's not 
You know, it's not going to be 100% effective, but at least it's something. Um, if you work or stuff like that, there's face shields that can be used. You can try something like that that will help some. Um, but that should be very, very kind of few and far between people that will, that have trouble with that. We had mentioned the children under age two and people who have mental difficulties or physical difficulties that cannot take it on and off. They really shouldn't be wearing one independently. Um, so there are some caveats to that, but that should be very rare, I would think. Okay. Commissioner, I do think one of the challenges we're facing is that, you know, in this age of social media and access to a wide variety of information at, the, at, the, at, at, our, finger at our fingertips, it's really easy to get information that's inaccurate, but sounds accurate, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's trying their very best to get accurate information. And sometimes it's hard to know if that's appropriate. I would say, um, one, make sure that the residents are looking at um, credible resources for the information, like the CDC, World <laughs> Health Organization, Cobb and Douglas Public Health, Georgia Department of Public Health, for the information about the efficacy of masks and the risks. Um, because it's really, I saw something the other day uh, on a family member's post that had a whole list of reasons why it was hazardous to wear a mask, and it just wasn't accurate. Um, and so I, I think everybody has the best of intentions. I really believe that about people. They just, it's hard to make sure what your information, that your information's accurate. So if they, people will go to those primary sources, I think that we'll be in better shape. Well, I think that's going to be a, 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 a fight that we all will have to conquer because at the end of the day, I, I understand the importance of wearing the mask and, and shields and any and everything to be preventive. However, you've got that, and I've read some of those posts that have these astronomical reasoning as to why you shouldn't, you know, but I just can't seem to pull out 1% of that to be accurate. But at the end of the day, I'll leave it. I guess I would... I would reference uh, Dr. Jackson Jones and Dr. Meemark um, and others who were maybe listening to this and say that for centuries, right, uh, medical folks have worn masks all day long um, without being having their health at risk. And I would expect, right, that if you had a group of physicians and nurses who were having um, hazardous health outcomes because of wearing a mask, we would have heard about that issue long before now. I would agree, I would agree. But I just know that's gonna be a task that we all will face in trying to get people to understand the importance of doing this versus not doing this. And all the conspiracy theorists who decide to say a lot of other things. So I'll yield back and I'll leave it at that. Thank you again. Thank you. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Commissioner Mitchell. And uh, Commissioner Carson, I see you. You yeah. would just add. Okay, Commissioner Carson. Thank you. Very quickly, um, two questions. Uh, one, can you talk about the difference between wearing the face shield versus face mask? And two, please think about walk-up um, sites versus drive-up sites, because everybody does not have a car. Those are my only two questions. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I yield the floor. Okay. Thank you, um, Commissioner Carthen. So, um, the the idea is that um, for everybody to wear a, you know, fitted facial mask. And so um, you, there are several different ones. You can do the surgical masks, which are um, which have some very good um, efficacy for those. But you can do at least a two-ply um, mask of just fabric, and those are, are helpful as well. If you decide to wear a, a face shield, which is additional um, protection, you are supposed to be wearing the some sort of fa uh, cloth covering or facial covering with the shield um, for additional um, protection. So, for example, that's kind of like the highest of the highest. So our drive-through and employees that um, constantly have people that are, um, they're in their, you know, realm when they're testing, um, will wear both the shield and the mask in one of the N95s because we, we really need them and we don't need them to get exposed to um, COVID-19. 
Um, so if you can wear both, that is really the, the best recommendation to do that. Um, if you are, so we had talked about, if you were really um, that sick that you can't wear them, I, I would really think twice before leaving your house and going to public places without being able to wear either of those. You're putting yourself at very exceptional risk. And we are seeing um, of the deaths and hospitalizations, people who are um, having <clears throat> heart conditions or have any lung conditions or immunocompromised are the ones that are at greatest risk of having some trouble from COVID-19. So I would think about that. And, and you're absolutely right. We are working on different places. So the um, outreach, I, I don't think it has to be um, 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 drive through. And even our locations, you can walk up and they try to, if they see that you're not in a car, they can try to get you over um, a little sooner so that you're not waiting in the elements. But that's definitely one of the outreach priorities we have is looking for places where people don't have to drive through because you're right, that is a social determinant of health. And if you can't to, um, drive, then you may not get tested. So we're making sure that we're very aware of that. But thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. Commissioner Guy, I believe you have one more comment, then we're going to move on. Thank you. Yes, I just want to segue off of uh, Commissioner Mitchell's uh, remarks. Uh, you know, Ephesus Baptist Church, they are on the western, far western side of the county, and they uh, are having a um, drive-through pantry <laughs> uh, this uh, Wednesday from three to five. But I just wanted, I noticed that you had New Mountaintop as a place for testing. Have you reached out to other pastors? Uh, why can't we do both on the same day? Have the testing because most churches have a very large parking lot. And if we could, uh, do some of the testing or at least give the churches something to hand out in their pantry um, uh, packages or boxes notifying people where they can be tested. So uh, we can kind of use uh, a lot of this. Also Midway Church, uh, I think it's Midway uh, Church that uh, does a pantry uh several times a month also. So we we have a, a way of reaching a lot of people that may not otherwise know about the testing. So uh, we might want to utilize both. Commissioner, we're meeting, we have an open Zoom uh, every two weeks with our district pastors uh, and uh, congregation folks where we're talking about issues that they're facing as they're trying to reopen. We also offer the testing option at that point too, but certainly if anybody has an interest in having us come test at their, at, at, in their church parking lot or during a pantry, um, a couple of ways. One, if you wanna send that to me, that's great, but if they wanna reach out to us through our Cobb and Douglas Public Health.org website under contact us, we're happy to respond and, and look to see if we can do those. There's, there isn't a reason why we couldn't do multiple locations. We just have to staff it in advance <laughs> and we have to do it far enough in advance that people can have time to pre-register on our site so that we have all the labels printed for the actual specimen collection. But is there a flyer that they could be handing out in their packages uh, notifying people where they could be tested? Yes, I think we, and um, I'll check again, but I think we have sent that um, testing flyer. It's on our website. It's also, I think we've sent it to Rick Martin, and I believe it's on the Douglas website. Folks are welcome to print those off and put, give them out uh, or post them while they're doing these pantries. All right. Thank, thank you. And I yield back. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. This. Uh, thank you. Um, Dr. Meemark and also Lisa for coming out this morning. We appreciate your time. This is well worth it for our uh, Board of Commissioners and also for our citizens. It, this is critical. And we are at a point that we want to make sure that this educational campaign is effective. And certainly I would like to just say Douglas County has kicked off again with something that is promising for our citizens. And hopefully, uh, you know, we are not at the point of mandating, but we are at the uh, point of changing behavior. And it takes a while. And I was just sharing with uh, one of our commissioners that uh, when you first, particularly me, is when I first started working in surgery, you forget about the mask. You walk in the room and then everybody point at you and say, they hold you accountable and say, you forgot your mask. And then you come out. So, and as I taught students, about 150 students, which are surgical technologists here in the state of Georgia, they have to do the same thing. So it's like 
behavior, it just takes a minute. It's like riding a bike. Once you ride your bike, you will just realize that you need your mask. So uh, I thank you so much, Board of Commissioners, for supporting uh, this effort, this educational campaign, and we'll see how it plays out. And uh, I'm quite sure uh, as the days go on in the state of Georgia, uh, certainly our governor may reconsider and add, but right now we we can't supersede his orders. All right, thank you all so much. And we're gonna move on to our next item, which is our COVID-19 grant update. And I do want to, before the county administrator is gonna bring this update to us, I wanted to just share- Madam Chair, go. Say that again. Go ahead, Madam Chair. Okay, no, I wanted to, Mark is gonna provide, Mark Till, our county administrator will be providing an update. Actually, he has two updates back to back, but I just wanted to just share about the, um, this uh, campaign, the educational campaign, there was some, I believe there was some questions out there. How is this campaign going to be funded? Uh, certainly with our COVID-19 funds, which is the CARES Act, which is federal government, they're asking all of us to do what we can. So this is COVID related. So citizens, those ones that have questions, this campaign has, uh, certainly I know uh, I'm like you, I'm very sensitive about my tax dollars, but this is federal government uh, tax, tax dollars that are coming to help support and teach and educate our citizens. And not only the citizens here in Douglas County, but the state of Georgia, the, the uh, nation and the globe. So Mark, I yield to you and thank you. You have two uh, presentations this morning. Yes, ma'am. Um, as far as the CARES Act, um, the funding is, uh, we were notified about a week ago. Uh, funding it will be based on population. Looks like we'll receive 1.661 million up front, uh, up to 5.5 million. And these are for necessary expenditures related to the public health emergency. Um, additional details will be provided by the state. Um, they, they will also be sending us information on the, the web portal uh, for us to be able to log on and receive these funds. Um, we've actually already given them, this was a couple months ago, all of our financial information. Uh, so we're waiting on that. We expect to hear something very soon, next couple of days. Um, and it's our understanding at this time, although additional information, like I said, will be provided by the state, um, that these expenditures include, but are not limited to, um, all the items that were included in the resolution approved by the board, which included hazard pay, um, and uh, numerous other items. I think that was 900,000 we had allocated uh, in the resolution. Um, all the COVID-19 expenses that we've been tracking, uh, the departments have spent, and then also possibly help um, for some of the small businesses. Um, and this is for the CARES Act. And uh, pretty much that's all I have right now, Madam Chair. Okay. Any questions? Well, I just want yeah. to make sure the Board of Commissioners knew that Tiffany Stewart Stanley has a more elaborate uh, uh, should I say, uh, presentation for us, but she couldn't be here this morning. So I just asked Mark to give you the abbreviated approach. And I see you, Commissioner Guider, your hand is up. <laughs> okay, uh, Mark, uh, you said that it was going to be based on population. Now, DCA puts out populations in between the censuses. Um, is this going to be based on the last census? Uh, almost 10 years ago, or is it going to be based on the current population per DCA? I'm not sure. Um, I know they have already allocated the money. So it's at 1.66 million up to 5.5 and they were based on population. I'm not sure which population they used. So we could back into that population, I guess. Yes, I'll check into it and let you know. Because DCA has a more current population rather than relying on the past uh, census that was taken 10 years ago. So it could make a big difference. So thank you. I yield back. Okay. And I, any other questions from the Board of Commissioners? And I saw your hand, David. Okay. Yes. I, I hear yes, but I don't see your face. Oh. Is it Commissioner Robinson? Did I hear your voice? Yes, ma'am. Oh, there you are. Okay. Am I on? Okay. Yes, All right. Yeah. Yep. I got it. Uh, yeah. Real quick, and uh, to the county administrator. So, how much money? And, and again, this is going to be a segue into our conversation probably a little bit later uh, with our financial advisor. 
uh, but this is a, a standalone um, topic, which is how much money have we spent so far on corporate related? Just I mind. do not have that exact number. Uh, I know is is my couple hundred thousand in there? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'll just go ahead, Mark. This is David Corbin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we spent a couple of hundred thousand uh, through all the departments, and then uh, I think we spent five hundred and something thousand on the hazard pay, and we've had some more expenses associated with the resolution. Yeah. Um, but I don't have the exact number in front of me now. All right, and, and here's where, and again, this is not a hard question or, or a slider. Um, one point, what did you say, 1.6 million? Yeah, 1.66 million up front, and then right. up to 5.5 million. Okay, Madam Chair, I believe early on our delegation asked a question directly to you, how much that we anticipate that we may need uh, at the very beginning of this, and I, I know you and I had the conversation, we were somewhere between one and two million. Uh, mm -hmm. Looks like we, 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 I mean, we had nothing to go on. We had no data, but we anticipated, obviously this is right smack dab uh, in the middle of the fairway uh, at 1.6. Uh, but my question becomes, okay, are we having a lot of, I mean, we get up to $5 million. Well, what is our projection? Uh, and I, I'm just not hearing what I need to hear, and David, maybe you'll answer this later, so we don't have to, you know, um, side. We don't have to hijack this moment, but I'm trying to get a feel for, like, okay, guys, this is not over. This COVID is not over. Now we've got some cash that's coming in to help us cover some of these costs. Lay out to me what my expense plan is going to be with COVID only related. It's great that you got access to a line of credit. It's up to. I, I get that. But I'm like, but well, what is the real need? And I haven't heard that yet. And I know we're working on that. And I'm sure we're going to get to that. But David, will you cover that later? Um, a little bit more detail. We don't, again, we've got another item coming up. Right, will you cover that later? Can you answer that question? I, I, will, try, I will try to answer that question. <laughs> okay. That, Madam Chair, let, let's let it be. I'm fine. I'll come back to it later. I yield. I'm fine. All right. Thank you so much. Yes, and, David Corbin, Mr. Corbin, you look like you wanted to say something, and I'm going to move on, but do you well, have I just something? wanted to make sure, a little bit piggybacking on um, what Vice Chair Robinson stated. These are reimbursable expenses, right? So, you know, I just want to make sure the finance department has a pretty good grip on accounting uh, for those expenses, because those ultimately have to be reported back to the state and, and corresponding to the federal government. So they're, they're almost treated as grant monies. So I want to make sure that everyone understands their reimbursable expenses directly, and we have to account for them very specifically and very appropriately. That's all. Yep. Yep. And we are doing that. Finance is tracking every department's expenses. Um, so they're submitting those to us through a spreadsheet uh, monthly, and we're tracking the expenses from the uh, from the resolution that was approved by the board. Yes. Okay. All right, if there are no other questions for you, Mark, regarding this topic, we're going to move on to the next item. Reopening of um, the Boundary Waters Aquatic Center, Parks and Recreation Measures and the Waiver Requirements. Mark, if you could just highlight those for us this morning. Yes, ma'am. So I'll try to pull up, uh, see if I can share this PowerPoint. Um, can everyone see that? Yes. Madam Chair, you see that? Yes, we can see. Yes. Okay, so as far as parks and recreation, um, so all the trails are open. Uh, the disc golf courses are open. We opened those a couple of weeks ago. Um, Boundary Waters Aquatic Center, I think, opened up on the 29th. Um, so as far as the Aquatic Center reopening, um, so it's 8 o'clock to 5 and then they close it from 10.30 to 12 daily to clean and disinfect. Um, you have a maximum of 11 people that are allowed in the pool at one time, one person per lane with a 45-minute maximum usage time, and then lanes must be reserved uh, in advance. And we have no land or water fitness classes offered during this phase one reopening. Um, all patrons must follow social distancing. Uh, the guidelines set forth by the health department and the CDC um, we're checking temperatures of everyone who comes in the building, employees and uh, citizens or patrons. 
uh, and we have plenty of signage posted as far as social distancing. Make sure you don't come in if you have any of the uh, the symptoms of the coronavirus. Uh, masks are required to be worn by patrons, um, except for in the pool. Can't, we're not requiring them in the pool. Um, and we have hand sanitizer available. Uh, staff wears masks and protective shields have been installed at the front desk. And then uh, any before uh, using the, f the facility uh, that essentially holds the county ha harmless for any exposure to COVID-19. Uh, the locker rooms are closed at this time. Uh, the restrooms at the front of the facility will be open. As far as uh, parks, athletics, and recreation, um, like I said before, we've already opened up the walking tracks, the trails, um, and then uh, so that includes Boundary Waters, Clinton, uh, Deer Lake Park, Dog River, Fair Play, and uh, Woodrow Wilson Park. So the hours are 8 o'clock a.m. until dark. Uh, these were affected June uh, 26, uh, 2020. So the restrooms were opened. They're clean and sanitized by parks maintenance staff three times daily. And then the 29th, we opened the athletic fields for small groups and practice um, and individual usage, each association. Uh, so they're required to submit a facility agreement form to reserve field space for one hour, um, only one team at a time. Uh, parents must sign a waiver. Um, and then uh, security officers are patrolling these practice fields to ensure uh, that the users have obtained permits and signed waivers. Uh, currently, the Deer Lake Activity Center, sports uh, complex buildings, pavilions, and playgrounds remain closed. And then the summer camp program and sports camps have been canceled. Uh, as far as the Douglas County Transportation Center, so we opened back up on June 22nd. Uh, same thing with temperature checks. So we provided uh, thermometers for every uh, facility in the county. Um, the ones that are open and not open so that we're prepared whenever we do open. So we're checking temperatures of every employee when they come in the building and then any uh, patrons of the building when they come in, we're checking checking those. We, if we have to meet with members of the public, we're conducting that in the lobby. So we're keeping our social distancing and appointments uh, requested from the public. Um, and then front counter staff is protected by the large glass shield and the building is wiped down and clean frequently and sanitized weekly. And those are just a couple of pictures. Some of the signage that's installed uh, in all county buildings. As far as libraries, libraries uh, plan to be open July 7th, which is today. Uh, no, tomorrow, sorry, today's the 6th, so they're closed on Monday. Um, so they're open Tuesdays from 9 to 6, Wednesdays they're closed for cleaning, and, and they're open Thursday and Friday from 9, well, Thursday 9 to 6, Friday 9 to 4, and then Saturday and Sunday they're closed. Um, so they have uh, the plexiglass barriers at the, de the front desks. Um, uh, temperatures are checked from staff and citizens coming into the building. So they clean high tra traffic areas hourly and they limit the amount of people in the building according to the guidelines set forth by uh, the governor and his executive order. And then all staff are wearing masks and we're strongly encouraging uh, citizens to wear masks as well. Uh, maintain social distance at all times. And then uh, curbside services are also still available. Some services that are temporarily unavailable, public computers, uh, printing can be done wirelessly. Uh, study rooms and meeting rooms will also be unavailable and story times and other in-house programs um, are not open at this time. So those are the, the three areas, Parks and Rec, Douglas County Libraries and uh, Connect Douglas. So are there any questions on these openings? 
Mark, thank you so much. Uh, certainly, I appreciate what uh, I know the Board of Commissioners appreciate as well, which is the uh, plexiglass that's being placed throughout the entire county, not in just uh, those areas you just mentioned, and then also the Tax Commissioner's Office as well. So we appreciate the extra layer of protection. Also, we have about 200,000 masks that have come in, Mark. If you could just chime in about those masks and where those masks, what locations are uh, those masks will be placed throughout the county. A uh, cloth mask. Yes, yeah, so we're, we're checking for, um, we're checking with GEMA currently and we're waiting to hear back from them on the the conditions or requirements as far as who we can provide those masks to. Um, but we plan to have those as long as we get the go ahead from GEMA um, at all county facilities that are open. So uh, parks and rec facilities, Connect Douglas, the libraries, uh, courthouse, so at as many locations as possible. Um, and we'll notify the public as far as when that happens. And it should be, I expect it to happen this week. Um, as soon as we get confirmation from GEMA. So yeah, we did get about 20,000 masks. Okay. Thank you so much. And also Board of Commissioners, uh, we certainly mandated mask uh, I have and given an order to, to uh, and along with the, our emergency management team to uh, mandate all um, employees wear masks in our government facilities, uh, unless it's certainly in the hallways, the vestibules and things like that, elevators, you have to have a mask and in your own private offices, you, uh, the employees are allowed uh, to wear masks. I mean, highly encouraging the city, whoever's in those public uh, government, governmental buildings to wear a mask. So that's very important. And I realize when you swim, you cannot wear one, but certainly when you're talking and chatting and sitting around on the sidelines, you need to have a mask on. So that's very, very important at this time. Um, any questions from the Board of Commissioners regarding this presentation? Okay. Yes. Well, okay, I, Commissioner Robinson, I'm beginning to learn. I don't see your face. Vice Chairman. That's okay. Uh, that's fine. Um, and, and I might have missed this part, and maybe it's another part of the agenda about the indoor facilities and programming. Are we going to come to that later or um, programming? And this is probably for our Parks and Rec Committee. Um, I, I'm trying to get a feel for we're emphasizing the Aquatic Center, uh, but there's different elements within our community that want access to their tax dollars. Uh, and so you know, we've gone through half the summer already, about to get back. Uh, and, I, and I'm thinking that we're, th there's a need for outlets. We've got these assets that are sitting here and we're just choosing to not address them. Uh, we're choosing not to, now we've got 1.6 million up to $5 million. Why can't we clean those facilities quite often now to allow citizens, uh, the youth to access them? Um, yet we want them to go to school, but I, I, I'm, listen, I'm I'm looking for a consistency of policy. I'm like, be consistent. You're going to give access to that, give access to everything. Figure out a solution that allows a consistent application of policy. Um, and I hear citizens say, well, what about us that don't swim that want to do this? And we're, we're, it's almost like, well, it doesn't matter. We're just not going, we're not going to deal with that. And I, and I, I I'm, I'm, I'm asking, and this is more for rhetorical. The citizens weigh in on this. this is, I don't debate this, I just listen. And it's more of a, hmm, what about everybody else? Um, yes, it, it, it may be risk, but the very thing we're talking about, well, we gotta go back to school, we gotta go back to work. Well, why can't they also have that opportunity? Uh, and I get the social distancing, but I, I don't wanna create a false enemy a false foe. The, the, the foe is not that, the foe is the bug. And as long as we can be sensitive, we, we, we wash our hands, we hand aside. I mean, I've looked at other models, other churches, other places that are doing this right now where they allow them, they clean every two hours, they put hand sanitizers every 20 minutes. I'm, I'm just, I'm not hearing the other parts of the plan. I'm, I'm hearing the convenient part of the plan that we can rationalize, but I'm not hearing like, well, what about everything else? Right, and those people like, well, my tax dollars. I mean, I get that their tax dollar goes to that, and they get to get that benefit. And I have no problem with that. But what my interests are is this part, and I haven't heard the the the, the um, um it, it, it's important. 
um, that outlet is important, right? We have a, a responsibility as, um, you know, the reason you have a parks and rec department is to have an outlet that society ain't all about being a sheep or, or being out there working and stuff and being a battery for the system. We provide outlets for them, right? And we have these assets that are here. And I know we're smart enough to come up with a program that allows us to, to allow them to participate. Now, I heard something about waivers and different things. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to design a solution, only to create uh, the moment that says, okay, guys, we're, we're, we're talking impartiality. We're, we're like, we're, okay, but what's the full plan? And maybe you guys have that, and that's why I want to be sensitive. I'll yield with this statement. That's about two minutes. I'll yield with this. Is, is, does park, either the administration or does the Parks and Rec Committee have a recommendation to the administration for the Board of Commissioners to consider the whole thing, not just this one part, because citizen, I'm getting the call says, well, what about this? Well, what about this? And it's like, well, it's not, we're not addressing it. It's almost like, well, we're not going to take that up. And I'm like, well, in the history of this county, you've never not had, I get the pandemic, but why are we being convenient for this one versus that one? Why can't we come up with a solution? So if we're not ready to address that right now, I'm okay. Um, I, I just, I have to put it out there. Uh, because again, it's, I'm, I'm just oversight. I'm not day to day. I'm not trying to be day to day, but I'm 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 advocating for the interests of citizens who say, well, wait a minute. I don't want all summer. Uh, I want to. I, I need something that 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 recreation is important. We want to give people outlets. I mean, I see the spike in divorce. I see the spike in domestic violence. I see the spike of standing. In, in, like, no, y'all not putting all that data together. We're, we're we're sort of overlooking this. Like, okay, that's an important element is giving them outlets. And we're the key to that. They, they use their tax dollars. We, we're the keys to that. And yet we're just sort of not helping with that as if it didn't matter. I, I, want, I, I don't even want a response. I want y'all to think about what we've done and what we're not doing regarding that, that like it, as if it didn't matter. I yield the floor. It, right, right. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So Madam Chair um, and Commissioners, so we have looked we're tracking what other counties are doing, what the school systems are doing. Um, mm -hmm. So right now it's recommended that a slow roll uh, opening. Um, and so the things that we have opened are some of the things that can open and still be, uh, have social distancing apply because um, mass gatherings are still limited, you know, and especially in light of the spike that we've recently um, seen with the cases from the coronavirus. Okay, thank you, uh, Commissioner Mitchell. I see you. You want to? Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I just want to chime in, Madam Chair. Just, and, and those should be very brief to answer Vice Chairman Robinson's uh, comments in reference to the, the committee having any input on whether or not this was the rollout, whether or not it was the plan, or was it even the recommendation. No input on that, uh, Vice Chair Robinson. And you two and I have actually received, and I can't speak for the other commissioners. Uh, several comments about what we should or shouldn't do, how we should do it or how we shouldn't do it. Uh, but this particular rollout was strictly, I guess, through staff and or Madam Chair, so I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Just those comments and those comments alone. I yield back. All right, thank you so much, Commissioner Mitchell. And certainly we are following those uh, those measures that are certainly built in, um, late, baked into the governor's orders and working closely with public health as we open these areas and certainly want to be sensitive to that and I'm sensitive to the needs of our citizens, but I'm very sensitive to their health as well. So uh, certainly someone who has a background in health, I would be, it would be ludicrous for me to open the whole place up realizing what's going on. So we're, we, we are, we've been very, we've been measuring and looking at other places to see what they're doing. We have allowed those teams, but in the small groups to come back and play baseball and things like that, but still, it's, again, it's contact. It's very difficult to maintain that six feet distance. Lisa, if you could chime in, I know you've been working with us and you've been helping us as much as possible. We have not made a move without public health. So if you could ch just chime in briefly. Sure, so the first thing I would say is that I've been so impressed by the staff, by Mark and Jason and all of the staff of being so purposeful and thoughtful and um, consistent with the governor's executive order because, you know, just because uh, we're county government doesn't mean that we're not subject to like the day camp or the summer camp or the parks openings. 
And so it is certainly a balance to come to look at the executive order and translate that to concrete practice. Um, and then also to look at the health status of the community and filter that in. So I'm very supportive of the slow roll that Mark mentioned, the slow roll that you all have taken um, to start to see, yes, let's open up these things and let's see how that goes. And if we can, and if folks are doing what they need to do while they're participating in those activities, then it makes you more confident to go, all right, let's take the next step. Um, and reopen. And then you, before you take the next step, you also look at the health status of the community and see um, where things stand. So I think this is a really good start. Um, I'm hopeful as well that over the next month or two that we'll be able to open up more things. Um, I am uh, really struggling not going back to my parks and rec activities <laughs> because I, you know, I'm in the group fitness exercise activities as well, and it's just not the time for that, um, considering the nature of a lot of those events or activities. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. And we're going to move on, Board of Commissioners, if there are no other comments. We're going to move on to financial risk analysis presentation. We have David Corbin here this uh, morning and Matthew Arrington from Terminus. You have the floor. David Corbin. Corbin. Sorry. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah, I think uh, I'll try to keep my comments fairly brief. I have also have my colleague Shamik um, stored on the line as well. And uh, this conversation really piggybacks off of a finance committee meeting we had, uh, I guess, several weeks ago, uh, where the county, uh, under under y'all's leadership, have asked us to work with staff to develop a financial model or at least a, a platform and protocol to keep up with various revenues and expenses uh, that are being impacted by COVID-19 and to try to put together some short-term outlook. I mean, I think heretofore we've spent a great deal of time producing long-term capital plans, uh, five-year outlooks, um, budgetary measures and policy initiatives. We sort of because of COVID-19 started, Commissioner Robinson and many of you wanted us to, to, to reverse that trend and look at what the budget would look like day to day, uh, given the impact of COVID. And based on a lot of what I've been hearing today from your health officials, our process is not too dissimilar. I mean, we are trying to figure out on a regular basis uh, which way the market is moving with regard to your financial status. Uh, basically, uh, we do think, to sum it all up, that there will be a decline in 2020 projected revenues. You had a 90, roughly a $97.7 million uh, revenue projection in 2020. We think that number is going to be uh, down by 3 to 5% uh, at this point in time, even with the reopenings. And you had $102 million, roughly, um, that, was, that would have been budgeted to cover projected expenditures, expenditures this year. And, you know, we've already gone above, you know, assuming that we spend that, that amount of money, uh, you know, on top of some of the COVID related items, which are now going to be reimbursed to some degree. Uh, we still think that there's going to be significant stress uh, on your uh, undesignated fund balance as we move forward. And so what we're trying to do is be mindful of the things that are that are taking place. We've had independent calls with the tax commissioner, uh, their office on terms of all your sources of revenues. We've had calls with uh, economic development. Uh, the digest is now coming. I think that data may be in Mark, uh, may be able to comment on that. I think that the digest values are expected this week if they haven't already come in. We're now looking at that and we're trying to keep up with what is happening in real time uh, as we get the data to make sure you have it so that you can make informed decisions. And at that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Robinson or Madam Chair, whoever may have questions regarding the specifics of, of where we think you are or, or anything else that may come up that we want to talk about. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner Robinson certainly is the and, and the vice chairman of the board of commissioners and the chairman of this uh, fine, of, of our finance committee. Do you have anything you want to weigh in with first? 
start yes. off. Mm -hmm. May I go? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it, it, again, this um, to, the, to the citizens of Douglas County and the full board of commissioners, um, as David Corbin mentioned, this is uh, this presentation, uh, this highlight presentation, is an output of our last finance committee. Um, it is the exact same presentation that was given to the finance committee uh, without alteration. Uh, that's been a commitment of our finance committee, which is to make sure that you guys have consistent information as as I do, uh, as Madam Chair does, um, as we make major decisions. As you guys know, we came into the 2020 budget cycle with a certain set of assumptions. Uh, the pandemic obviously threw uh, a serious curveball. All bets are off. Uh, we asked David Corbin earlier this year to sort of begin to help us assess uh, our outlook. We need to revisit things. Um, and that is the intent to do so. Um, after this, um, obviously, we'll be going into our mid-year budget retreat uh, where we have to sit down and, and look at things for what they are. Um, do we need to make any material adjustments or not? Uh, but we are looking at not just for the next six months, but again, the goal is to look at like an 18-month window. That's always been the goal. Go pull any tape. It was to bridge our current status with the future. Right? Um, it's, it's one thing we can... We, we, we can hope for the best, but you all should plan for the worst. You land somewhere in the middle, and I'm always that guy about the fairway. Um, up until this point, um, I, I have no additional data other than the last. David answered the question, um, and, and I'll, I'll move into it, let my peers speak. Uh, this, what you've done, this stress testing that you've done, how far have you done it through? Through May or through June? Probably just May, right? No, I think, I think, uh, Cindy, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we, we recently updated, the, at least the COVID numbers are updated through June. Is that correct, Shanique? COVID numbers are updated through the end of May, through May 30th. Yeah, we okay. haven't seen June's information as yet. Okay. All right. So, all right. So, and, and so with that being said, um, 102 expenses, 97 million in revenue, three to five percent correction. That was eight million. Did I do that right? Yeah, you're you're gonna you're gonna be in that in that range. You have some balance between the two. There's definitely gonna be a, there's a structural imbalance right now. So assuming that you assuming that you spend 102 million, I think that's a safe bet. It's not again. You, you're you. You've budgeted, you've had a supplemental budget, which you've budgeted more than the original 102. Yep. Historically, the county has has come in at 2 to 3% under that number, historically. Yep. Yep. Um, you're going to get reimbursed for some of the COVID-related expenses that you have. So we think you're going to come in on target right now on the, on the budgeted revenues at 102, roughly 102. Yep. But it's the revenue decline, right? It's the revenue decline uh that we're looking at that's problematic right now which, which is consistent with our um our um, actuarial um guy last year the, our auditor um who, who who spoke to us and says that obviously it is declining so we that that's not new but now it's more real six months later that being said i'm gonna um so with an eight eight million dollars uh we know the market is soft we know that congress has um, done a job to try to float um us meaning collectively uh, either direct payments to individuals or to do obviously local contributions by giving people relief, PPP, you name it. Um, not, not, notwithstanding anything we've done locally, other than we as the government have done some cost savings um, within, uh, and, and I'm, sure, I'm sure your staff, Mark, can speak to some of the cost savings that have been done up until this point. Um, you, we've got a, a $8 million variance, and we've done some things to sort of shore that up. But the goal is, um, David, is that you will have some options for us going into our mid-year retreat. Once we get the full digest in from Benny and the tax commissioner, that we'll have a robust conversation. Is that the end goal? The goal is to provide you with those alternatives. Right. right. Is um, Jennifer Hallman on the phone? Madam Chair, may I speak to Jennifer Hallman? Yes, if she's uh, Commissioner Robinson, oh, it's out sick. Uh, oh. Jennifer's out sick today. Oh boy. Okay. We'll keep it moving. Can you speak to, I, I just had a general question, but we are prepared uh, to speak to the full board of commissioners during the mid-year budget retreat. Do we know when that date has been set? 
We uh. do not yet. I think we're still waiting on the digest, and we're not sure if with the um, Board of uh, Department of Education, with them having to kind of pause theirs, if that's holding our digest up or not. Can we get an answer to that? Um, is Ken Bernard on the call? Somebody, I, I need to know specifically what our end dates are so we can make sure that we don't miss our numbers. I get the Board of Education is a separate entity, uh, but yet at the end of the day, what does that mean for us um, so that we can plan? What I don't want to do is shotgun the Board of Commissioners with a financial decision based on some time frame that all of a sudden we just now realize, oh, it's due tomorrow. Can you guys help us, please? I know Jennifer's reached out to um, Benny and Mr. Baker, and we can do that again to see kind of where they stand. Because that's just what we're waiting on. Once we get that, we can set a date. Okay. All right, Madam Chair, I yield. I, it, this is for the Board of Commissioners. It's just a repeat of our Finance Committee, so I, I yield now. Okay. Mark, if you could, could you just share with the Board of Commissioners some of those expense reductions and the approach that we've taken? Madam Chair, I'm on, the, I'm on the line. It's disconnected for a second if you need, Ken. Oh. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Mark, if you could just share. Yeah. Uh, some things Commissioner have Robinson, done. I'm sorry. It broke up right when I went to hit the mute button. But I think your question is, when do we have to have our numbers for the purpose of the digest and for the millage rate? Is that what I understood the question? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. I, I think that those, if you count back from, no, uh, usually the digest is closed and David or Mark can correct me if I'm wrong. I want to say at the end of July, it typically closes subject to appeals. Uh, and and you Usually we have some meeting between now uh, and uh, end of August, 1st of September for purposes of publishing the millage rate <laughs> after we get it from the school board uh, and related entities that goes on there. It's a little off, off, as you know, because the digest closes while we're actually in a budget cycle year already. Uh, but usually that the, the time for adoption of the millage rate is uh, late summer, early fall, so that the bills can go out timely and be due on November 15th. Mark, is that right? Yes. Yes, well, we should find out. Um, uh, we were hoping to find out by the end of last week, uh, first part of this week, the digest hopefully will be um, completed by the tax commissioner and um, the appraisal department. So once we have the digest, then we will work on setting the date for the mid-year retreat. Um, so we're on track, we're on schedule to have it either on or before when we have in the past couple of years. So right now we're on schedule. All right, and again, I just uh, before you get into the details okay. of that. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, Madam Chair. Yeah, to, to that point, um, if there's a delay in the digest for whatever reason, and specifically the Board of Education, which is, this is not a, a bad thing, it's, 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 a, it's a function of reality. If we delay um, two weeks or 30 days, for whatever reason, that means that the revenue that we'll be collecting at the end of the year will be delayed by 30 days. My question, and, and it, obviously it's, it's a domino effect. One more time, the financial model that we're creating, uh, back to David Corbin, our, 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 is our model that you're creating for us allows us to anticipate sensitivity analysis say, okay, guys, we, we, we can't be linear and structured. Y'all know how this works, right? And it's something that we can't, we can't control. We're not in control of this part. So uh, how flexible are you being able to outlook, to be able to move numbers to say that, okay, well, if this comes in, I think you know what I'm asking. Can you answer that, please? Yeah, so, so the model will support any variation in, in revenue collection, I don't think that it's it's been it's been set up. Uh, right now, we've obviously made the assumption that revenues are going to come in at an appropriate time. We've asked the tax commissioner, we've <laughs> asked uh, Benny, we've made some assumptions. So those assumptions can change, right? Those assumptions can change, um, and we are prepared to to incorporate those in. Uh, in, in when we have that retreat. We'll have those laid out for you at that point. I think we'll have a clear picture by that point in time. Yeah. It's week by week. I understand. Madam Chair, yeah. thank you. Yep. Okay. I have a quick question before I um, ask Mark to provide uh, his update regarding our reduction in expenses. David, um, certainly we had a surprise uh, in the month of, I believe, May or even, yeah, June. 
where the Correct. expenses both floss was great. You know, we were the same amount that we were last year and also our uh, lost numbers came in. So I know initially we were projecting a 20% loss in revenues and then it moved to 11. So is that where you're getting your 3% from today? Is that, did that have an impact? Uh, you know, I, as much as, yeah, Madam Chair, that's a good question. As much as I try, you know, it's almost like watching a, a, a kettle <laughs> boil. I, I, you know, as much as we try to look at numbers on a, sometimes a weekly, even a monthly basis as they come in, we still have to keep that in context with the bigger picture, which is you had 90 days here, roughly, of almost no activity, All right? And so if we do just as, if we do just as well as you did the prior year, that's still, from our perspective, from a global perspective, that means you would have lost approximately about 5% of your revenue. If you match what you did last year, Revenue for dollar for dollar, that means you're still, because we had projected originally the assumption in the budget for 2020 was an increase of about $5 million in revenue, that we're not, we're not seeing that increase. So, for, you know, I just want to make sure we're, we're comparing apples to apples. If we can get back to 19 revenue, that's great. But we projected not just 19. We projected 5 million above 19. That I'm not sure we're going to quite get to this year. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. And Mark, if you could just share with the, uh, with the you know, with the first of all, the board of commissioners, and then the citizens about those expense reductions that we attacked very early on to see what we could do to just take some of the pressure off the reduction of those expenses that were projected to come in. Mark, you have the floor. Yes, ma'am. So a couple of months ago, we. Um, put a hold on all hiring of vacancies and new positions um, that excluded public safety um, and then we had to open up allow some of those um, here lately because of the opening of the aquatic center and uh, you know some other some other items but so any non-essential vacancies we have we're not hiring for those and then also as far as expenses so any non-essential expenses, um, so we're watching all those as people submit requisitions. Uh, and if it's something that uh, we can get by without right now, then we don't approve those. So we've cut down non-essential expenses and uh, hiring of vacancies. Okay. And certainly if you could just check chat about the cash flows have been better than expected. So we're still, again, just holding. And if, if you could, uh, for our, our finance meeting, Mark, would like to see if you all could quantify those expenses that we've been able to hold off in terms of savings, what, what they look like. And again, as I mentioned in our last meeting, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that our, our constitutional officers and our elected officials and our uh, staff uh, should I say our directors will work with us on continuing to maintain that shift in reduction of expenses throughout the entire year because it seems like COVID-19 is not going anywhere. So our model for this year will change and hopefully that will have an impact on your outcomes and your 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 model, um, Mr. Corbett. So, yeah, that so there? Yeah, yeah okay. let, me, let me just add, I, I think the best way to say this is, I think under, under the collective leadership of the, the administration and staff, y'all have taken some initial appropriate steps to address the, the expense issue in a manner that I think was, is, is justified. The issue really is, is you know, the decline in revenue because of COVID-related issues, right, is, is bigger than the expense that you're, 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 you're attempting to cut. And at some point, the government has to provide services 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And there's only so much at a, some level that you can cut and get down to. Mm -hmm. It's the it's the revenue side right now that's really what we can't control. Right. And and that decline is out. It's just it, that is happening at a rate faster than what you can you can probably cut at this okay. point to to provide the same level of services to to that you need to provide in the community. Right. And I I, I guess on a good note. The, with the rate being so exponentially, it's it's not only related to just Douglas County, it's, it's, it's all across the entire globe, Correct. the nation. 
suddenly Correct. puts us in a position to be able to just say this is something beyond or out of our control and nothing that was done uh, intentional. So, again, thank you, and we look forward to a great report coming up soon. Uh, Mr. Corbin, I appreciate you and, and Terminus and all the great work you do to support us. Thank you. And I'll see you soon. All right, we're going to move on. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Geider. I'm sorry. Uh, while we have Ms. Corbin on, on the line, um, you are kind of trying to tell us that we've got to cut expenditures. Um, I can't Background noise, Madam Chair. Yep. Yeah, I couldn't hear. Please, because um, we can't yes. increase the revenues um, that we've lost. But uh, we're going to have to. Are you? working with the chairman and the finance committee about expenditures that we could cut at this time uh, that was approved in the budget. Uh, are you on board with um, the chairman and the finance committee and the um, county manager on what we could cut for this year? So, so th that I th you know, thank you for your question, Commissioner Guider. I think uh, our goal over the next uh, between now and the, and the retreat is to get together with the, the staff, get together with with Madam Chair and and Vice Chair Robinson to talk about the complete picture because there are really two sides to it, right? We can look at cutting expenditures, but the only thing I take I take uh, maybe issue with is. You, you do have some, there are certain controls that you do have on the revenue side. It may not be related to sales taxes, but you have the ability to raise some revenue. Uh, so it's going to be some combination. Your options, I would be remiss if I told you that your only option was to cut. You also have options to raise revenue to some degree. I'm not saying that you want to do that. It has to be done in balance. And our goal will be to give you a matrix of those combinations of cost-cutting measures and revenue and revenue uh, based um, options that you have at your disposal to move on to, to, to deal with the, what's in what's in front of you. Now the CARES grant um, it has to be COVID related. Well, loss of revenue is COVID related. <clears throat> so um, on recoup any loss of revenue because of the no, shutdown. No, ma'am. Um, under the CARES Act, if, we, if you know, based on our understanding, we work with a, um, a, a number of municipalities on this issue. It is for direct related expenses that you have incurred as a result of it. It doesn't cover, you know, for the same. Look, insurance companies are fighting their business owners over business interruption, right? This this is almost similar to that, other than the CARES Act doesn't designate loss of revenue related to COVID is one of those items that's reimbursable. It's going to have to be direct expenses that and on initiatives and things that you do uh, within the community to, um, to, to, to address this issue. Also, has there been a, a memo sent out to all department heads and elected officials asking them to cut their budget a certain percentage? I will defer to Mark. Uh, on, on and Sabrina, if she's on the call for that one. Yes, no, at this time, no, ma'am, that has not been done. Uh, won't we need that information? Um, nobody knows what they can cut more than the department head or the elected official. So, uh, I think we need to give them the first choice of what uh, they know that they can do without this year that was in their budget. So, um, <clears throat> Otherwise, you know, we may be talking about furloughs down the road. So uh, it would behoove all of us to be working uh, with each other and the department heads and the elected officials, even though the elected officials, once the budget is approved for them, they can keep it. But we're asking all departments to cut, or we should be asking all departments to cut a certain percentage out of their budget if at all possible. And if not, they need to come before uh, Mark and the finance uh, committee and the chairman to tell them why they cannot cut 
uh, an expenditure for this year. But we, we need to get them on board before we have our mid-year retreat because uh, definitely they would know better than we would. So, um, and I would just suggest that we, we start on that as soon as possible. But so, um, go ahead. No, I, so let, let me just, again, so, so, so we're not, um, I, again, I don't want to want you to leave the call. I think the initiative was to get through this meeting, <clears throat> get together with this, the, the finance staff and Mark about looking at whatever your options are, some on the revenue side, some on the expense side. Um, the way your budget is structured, I've always indicated that roughly you have about a nickel at any point in time between what you bring in and what you spend. There's about a 5% margin there at any point in time. Um, when we start to talk about cuts, if we go, if we talk about it proportionally, just to make sure you're, you know, you understand that out of a hundred million dollar budget, about 60, 60% 60 of that number roughly, um, is public safety. So structurally, you know, it's, it's, you know, we can't, cut the budget, you know, I'm not saying we can't cut, the, the, the budget cuts don't have as meaningful an impact on the finance department as they would have on public safety. So that's a global, I mean, it's, 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 it's very easy for us to say, everyone go out and cut 10% of your budget. Uh, and that obviously would fall, you know, purport, you know, in proportional terms on the public safety environment, which is gonna then lead to a number of policy issues that you're gonna have to decide. Our goal will be between now and that retreat, to provide you with a very comprehensive assessment of what you can, what you can do, not, not w just what you can do, and let you decide on how you want to go about doing it. Uh, but we are at that point where critical decisions will probably need to be made on the revenue revenue side and the expense side. And Mark and Jennifer and I have talked about that, and we're proceeding, you know, moving forward with coming up with those options for you. Uh, well, that's why I think it's very important to get with each official and each uh, department head as soon as possible to see what is possible. Uh, maybe some things can be deferred to next uh, that was in the budget for this year. It can be delayed. So, um, And um, when you talk about revenues, um, I don't know if you're hinting at a uh, <laughs> tax increase, that'd be like kicking someone while they're down because people are already hurting. So I, I think that should be the last resort. But with that, I yield back. So okay. let me, again, if I can just, I'm sorry, I'm not heading at it. All, I'm, all I wanna do is make sure I provide you with a range of options uh, that are available to you and and how you pr prioritize them obviously is, is um, important for your community. Uh, I just want to make sure you have the options available to you. Thank you so much, um, yep, David. No problem. Commissioner Guider, and I just wanted to share with you briefly, Commissioner mm -hmm. Guider, that some provisions are being made to speak with those uh, constitutional officers and also our directors to have budget improvement requests. All those are frozen, and the goal is, and I'll be chatting with all of them to just, just, to just allow us to make it through this year. And certainly they don't have a choice uh, based on our conditions uh, of the budget at this time. So I'm, uh, that conversation, I've been chatting briefly with some of our uh, folks that had something in the budget, but certainly business is not as usual. And of, of course, uh, the COVID-19 is requiring behavior change and this budget will require one as well. So we, we, we have to make adjustments. It is what it is. And certainly you cannot get juice out of a turnip and our citizens are, they're down right now. So we just want to, we, I know you're going to give us several options and uh, I appreciate you and all the work that you're doing. And uh, Commissioner Carthen, I see you, you came up on, on the screen. Commissioner Carthen, then we're going to move on after you. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Jones, uh, Director Teal, have we came up with a plan in relation to the COVID um, CARES Act? Uh, one of the things that I was reading that you sent out to us in the email was that uh, Governor Kemp states that what we don't use, we would have to give back. So has there been a plan to uh, 
use those funds so that we don't have to send them back to the state. And looking at the report that was provided, it seems as though we've only spent about $172,000 in relation to COVID-19 um, expenditures. So if we're requesting 1 million, a little over 1 million, how will that uh, impact us? What, what are we gonna do with that? Because I haven't seen anything. Okay, and let me let me start first, Mark, and then I'll allow you to chime in. Certainly, uh, right now, Mark, the hazardous pay is not one hundred thousand; it's five hundred thousand. So that should be included in that number for the one point six. And also, CSB was four hundred and ten thousand or four hundred and five thousand because of the offset that we had to go there. So I'm believing that's that's part of the projection. And then, of course, the hundred and fifty thousand dollars that was allowed for me to utilize, and certainly the board of commissioners to share on those uh, homeless population, the veterans. And we're using uh, right now, I believe we used about 40,000 of those dollars and we will continue to utilize. And this this uh, number goes out to the end of the year. And I agree with you, Commissioner Carthen, because we have that five point five million dollar pocket. I would like to see and we do have a plan that's coming. Actually, Tiffany was going to pre present that plan this morning. That plan is also it includes our small businesses because we did have Chris Pumphrey and uh, we had Sarah Ray approach the Board of Commissioners several uh, probably about a month ago, and certainly when we were looking at the hazardous pay, we were not in the position to help. So we do have a, 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 a litany of things that we will be able to offset, not only just for county government, we want to be able to help our businesses and, and, and other uh, avenues. And Mark, I'm, I'm not sure if you have that list, but Tiffany was prepared to give a big uh, PowerPoint presentation this morning, and I apologize, she's under the weather. Uh, Mark, please chime in, and then for Commissioner. Yeah, so I'll I'll send uh, the numbers out that we have uh, paid to date, and yes, it's uh, including the numbers in the resolution plus the expenses from uh, departments. I'm just I'm throwing a number out there. It's pr approximately six seven seven hundred thousand dollars to date, um, but I'll I'll get you the exact number um, later today. Is it also my understanding that now we can get reimbursed for the funds that we utilize to give hazard pay? Because I know beforehand we were stating because we didn't have a resolution or an ordinance for that, that we couldn't get yes. approved. Yes, ma'am. But that was if we were getting reimbursed from GEMA or FEMA, okay. which that's different from the CARES Act. Okay. But it's my understanding that, yes, the hazard pay is included. Um, any money, money that the board decides to give to small businesses, I know that came up a couple of months ago, um, and it may come around again. And, and as will. far as you know, the hazard pay, um, the other items in the resolution, I think um, that we have spent plus you know the, the expenses from the departments, which is probably a little under two hundred thousand dollars. But I'll get uh, I'll send those totals out okay. to date uh, today. Great, and, and it's just uh, you know I, I'll say this. It behooves us to utilize everybody on the Board of Commissioners when we're doing these things. It kind of seems like we're working in silos and I don't want us to work in silos. We have to get everybody's input so that collectively we have a plan that everybody feels good about backing. So um, I know, you know, we, we've not been in person, so we can't talk as much but still utilizing a way to get the input of each of the commissioners, I think is vital in making sure that we have a plan that we all are on board with. But with that, Madam Chair, I yield. And also, Commissioner, just to respond to your question, we just received notification uh, a couple of days ago about this funding. And the goal is Tiffany Stewart Stanley and all of us, we were gonna, I, particularly me, was going to put all of us at the table together so we could talk about a plan. Nothing is set in stone yet. So, no, that is the plan so we can get a list of responses from everybody and input regarding this money. Particularly, uh, the small businesses are important to all of us, and we want to come back to the table. So, that is being discussed. And the money, we just really released the information to you all, what, about three days ago, four days ago. So, it's still fresh in our minds, and we have not moved. We will not move without the Board of Commissioners, and I promise you that. So we're not working in silos. We just, we really, I was just blown away that we got this money. I didn't realize it was coming. So excited about that. I call it a bailout. And uh, hopefully CARES Act 5, uh, I believe 4 or 5, will address uh, maybe offsetting some revenue within the, in the counties. That would be great if we could get to that point. So stay tuned, it's coming. I was hoping Tiffany would be here today, but she just didn't make it. And Commissioner Mitchell, I see you. So do you have anything? 
Yeah. Just, just, just a couple of things. So, so David. Um, yes, sir. The three to five percent. I think I'm leaning on where Commissioner Guider was going with this. What, what is that in numbers? If you have to put a number with that, that's one million dollars, eight million dollars. Uh, yeah, Shan that's a good question. So, Shanique, well, can you post the matrix on on the screen for us, please? So what I have now posted on the screen um, is what that matrix looks like. So go go to the prior page for me, Shanique, page three of the slide. You told me to play that he's disappointed now? Yes. You told me to stop. So C Commissioner Mitchell, at the bottom of the uh, presentation there on that particular page, a 1% decrease in revenue is approximately $977,000, okay. roughly a million bucks. and, and right. A one percent increase in expenses is basically a million, a, a million, million two, a million two. Right. Yeah. So you know we're bouncing between. If you go to the next slide for us now, so you can go across and say, you know, look, if I have a, a one percent increase in expenses and a one percent increase in a uh, one percent decrease in in revenue, that's the impact right there. So that would be in this case a two million dollar roughly impact to your general fund in terms of your existing fund balance, right? So we've tried to create this matrix to give you a sense of where this may end up at at the end of the day. Got it. And we were anticipating about a $5 million increase in revenue based on the mere fact of what we had budgeted, am I correct? Correct. So your budgeted number, uh, your budgeted number was 97.719 for the year. Mm-hmm. Your prior year revenue for 2019 was approximately 92 million. And and, and I know you're going to go. Up. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, that, so so that's where the five million dollar increase came from. Right. Well, I get it. And, and I know you'll you'll review all this once you guys go to the committee, and then we'll go out on our retreat and do all these numbers and, and additions and cuts and whatever that ends up being. Though. But share with me how is a hiring freeze. Uh, if we if we didn't hire anybody, if we hired somebody, then you're right that would have an impact on the budget as an expense. But freezing it, nothing more than that dollar won't be moved or it's for expense. Yeah. So so that well so so there there are probably and I don't remember the exact number and I apologize. It, within your budget, for instance, the, the uh, public safety has so many designated vacancies. Mm -hmm. That you have you have funded. If those jobs have not been filled to date, that money will go back effectively go back into the general fund. It go back it goes back into the fund balance, mm -hmm. so to say, right? So you know we're assuming, that, you know, historically, you have budgeted for a dollar, but you've spent ninety eight ninety eight cents of that every particular year because vacancies aren't filled. Projects are delayed. Something is going on within that. We assume that that cushion, that two percent cushion, will will also be recognized this year because you're now diligent enough to know that if I haven't filled the vacancy by now, I might as well not fill that vacancy by now. And there's been a hiring freeze, so that vacancy will not be filled. The, okay. the, the, now the balance of that is we're, we're, we're and so instead of saying. We're not. We don't think there's going to be a, an overall decrease in the expenses. We think it's going to probably end up being similar to um, you're going to come in almost at budget this year. And part of that, part of the issue is, if you, uh, Shani, can you put up slide three again for me, please? You, you've got the. 2020 pension adjustments. You've got you you've approved. Um, you know w whether the CSB funding is reimbursable or not. I, I you know I'm not quite sure. So some of that offset that I thought you were going to see in the decrease in your budget, uh, your budgeted expenditures are actually being you know you, you have to take into account. You've got about 2.7 million dollars of unforeseen items that have now come up that would have all that have taken that out. So my thing, my my theory is that you're probably going to come in right at 100, somewhere around 102 million dollars at the end of the day. Okay, okay. I, I know we've got a lot of work to do here, but got a lot of work to do. And and you know, as Commissioner Guider stated, I, I hope 
I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that there's not a military increase, but my thoughts are, I don't see any way around it, but we'll see where that ends up though. And I know that's not your job to tell us kind of what that looks like, but we'll, we'll see at the retreat and we'll see what you, what the finance committee come back with. So I'll, I'll yield back and leave it there. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner Mitchell. And with that being said, we're going to move on to the next item. And thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. We're going to move on to tab number four. We have uh, three resolutions that's coming up, and I'll just read what briefly those are about and certainly allow the uh, legal department to chime in. Tab number four is a resolution to regulate and provide uh, for the calling of election to authorize Douglas County to exercise redevelopment powers and for other purposes and authorize the chairman to sign all necessary documents subject to final legal review. And certainly, uh, Ken, that you chime in on that, our uh, attorney, Bernard. Yes, ma'am. You, you're okay. talking about the resolution. Yes. I'm sorry, uh, you cut out. Uh, tab number four, yes, about the, for the re redevelopment powers. Yes, Madam Chair, uh, the the local delegation at the state house, uh, le state legislature passed a local bill that authorized the calling of an election by the superintendent of elections or the supervisor of elections and the board of elections for this November's ballot to have a referendum question about the county having re uh, redevelopment powers. This is merely a ministerial act of carrying out that legislation so that it's on record that the uh, board of elections and registration will have a referendum regarding the redevelopment powers. This is not the approval of a specific TAD. This is not the approval of a specific anything. All it is is enabling legislation so that if the voters pass a referendum, you, the county would have the same redevelopment powers that the city of Douglasville has and other counties and cities has. Uh, any potential TAD would have to be vetted, obviously, and approved through another process. This simply is authorizing us to have those powers that are conferred by state law. And so it'll be on the ballot. Uh, I have talked to Milton. Milton has requested that we pass this uh, call, even though technically the legislation is the real call for the uh, ballot question. And it'll be on your November ballot. And they are prepared for this. Uh, we are just doing our part so that their records are documented correctly. OK, thank you so much. Any questions from the board? if I move on to the next item. Okay, I move to tab number five, a resolution supporting House Bill 426, the Georgia Enhanced Penalties for Hate Crimes Act and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Um, legal? Madam, yes, yeah. Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, you asked us to put this on, but mm -hmm. as you're aware, because of our meeting schedule, the, the House Bill 426 passed both houses were signed by the governor on June 26, but you still wanted this left on to show the importance of the board's support for this uh, Georgia Enhanced Penalties for Hate Crimes Act so that the board could make a statement on that issue. It has been prepared in accordance with those directions and that it stands before you now, but it is the law in the state of Georgia now. Okay, thank you so much. Any questions from the board? And the next one, next item is tab number six, a resolution in support of the CDC recommendations of wearing masks, face coverings in all public places where social distancing is difficult to maintain and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Legal? Madam Chair, this at your direction and based on the conversation that this board had earlier with public health, it's simply a resolution supporting the CDC's recommendations regarding face coverings in public places, et cetera. It is not a letter, it, it is not a direction. It, it is not a law. It is just showing our support that people take the best practices steps recommended by the CDC for face coverings and other such uh, social distancing uh, as they recommend in public places. So this is a affirmation of y'all's intent to recommend strongly that folks uh, follow those guidelines. Okay, thank you so much, Attorney Bernard. Any questions from the board or comments? All right, I'll move on. Commissioner Carthen. Yes, Madam okay. Chair. Thank you uh, for allowing me to take the floor. Uh, 
Attorney Bernard, some of the um, in the resolution for the redevelopment, if you look at it, redevelopment is not spelled correctly. So you may want to have uh, Jennifer take a look at that. We don't want Chairman Jones signing something that's not <laughs> totally right. Uh, and sure. OK. And um, so all three of the resolutions have gone before legal and you you have had a chance to to look at it, Attorney Bernard. All three of them have, have been drafted out of the legal department. They have changed because of various and sundry things, and they will be reviewed by me as soon as I get off this speaker to make sure they are spelled correctly and everything else. There's been some back and forth between the legal department and uh, the commissioner and also uh, Tiffany Stewart Stanley on some of these because of what was going on at the state at the same time. So I can't, I'm not going to lie to you, I haven't read today's version because it's changed 14 times, but I promise you tomorrow it will be spelled right. It will look pretty and it'll have my name on it. And it will have it. Wonderful. That's what I like to hear because you know how I am. And secondly, uh, is this, so are we, the entire board, going to um, vote upon this or is this just Madam Chair's resolution? Well, the the board is going, it's a, it's a resolution proposed for the board's consideration by Madam Chair. Okay, because I only saw Madam Chair's name on it, so I wasn't sure if this was coming from her desk or, or if it's um, for the entire board of commissioners. The, the resolution will be signed by everybody Okay. Uh, if it passes, it just simply is in draft form for discussion okay. today because there's some turning events in the last week or so gotcha. that may have changed the ultimate. But it is a board board resolution for everybody. Okay, wonderful. Jennifer I think Moore is, Jennifer, Jennifer Moore is on, and she's hearing this, and those changes will be made. <laughs> all right, I trust I trust you. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that um, we were all on board. I think they're great resolutions and, and definitely they coincide with what we are trying to do as a board to ensure that we are um, having uh, fairness and equity uh, across the board and what we stand for, especially the masking up, the campaign that Chairman Jones has started, great campaign. And um, we definitely want to uh, to um, jump on board with the chamber and the state of Georgia in regards to the hate crime bill. And uh, so I'm excited. Thank you so much. I yield the floor, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Commissioner Carthen. All right, we're going to move on to tab number seven, business items. Authorization to renew a maintenance agreement uh, on August 1st, 2020 through uh, July 30th, 2021 with Doran Precision Systems in the amount of $9,975 for team driving simulator and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents pending final legal review. Uh, we have Major Holmes, are you on the line? Mark, can you speak to this item for Major Holmes or? Mark. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, I think he's on here. He was on here earlier. Um, Is anyone here from the Sheriff Department on here? Yeah, Bobby's on. Okay. He must be on mute. Well, what we'll do, we'll come back to that one since yep. he's on. I'll call him real quick, Madam Chair. Okay, I'm going to move on to tab number eight, authorization to award an on-demand consulting contract uh, to Atkins North America Incorporation and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Valentin. Yes, good afternoon, Madam Chair and commissioners. Uh, this item was uh, approved by the board back in May. Uh, the, the name listed on the contract was um, Atkins, as opposed to uh, uh, their legal name, Atkins North America Inc. So this is essentially to correct uh, their legal contracting name. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the board? I believe that's pretty self-explanatory. Madam uh, Chair, I do. Mm -hmm. Commissioner. Director Valentin, how are you? I feel like I'm I haven't seen you in forever. Commissioner? I'm good. Uh, was how was this caught like who caught this in the in the process to bring it back before us it uh, actually we sent the contract to the company and it went to their legal department and it was their legal department that uh, caught it okay great 
So this, this just raises a flag as to we have to make sure that when we send things out, we are following the letter because we don't want to have to come back and do things like this and they appear back on the agenda. So we just want to make sure that we, we're doing our our part before it goes out. Because again, we don't want to have Madam Chair who represents the entire board to be signing things and then they're not right. So um, that was all. Thank you. Understood. I yield the floor, Madam Chair. All right, thank you so much, Commissioner Carthen. We're gonna move on to tab number nine, authorization to award a consulting services contract to AMCOM Technical Services Incorporation and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Valentin, once again. Yes, Madam Chair, this is similar to the previous uh, item. Uh, in the contract, we, we listed AECOM, which is their common name, uh, and, but uh, their, their contracting name is AECOM Technical Services Inc. And so this is to correct uh, that element of the contract. Okay. Any questions from the board? Comments? Yes. All right. Uh, mm -hmm. Vice Chairman Robinson. Right. Which uh, I think to, to Madam Carthen's point, we've got two line items here. That I mean, we went through a process of RFQ, went through a process of selecting a certain set of vendors to be on standby. Um, we, we, we talk about standards, we, we, we talk about protocols, uh, we, we talk about how we maintain, and this is where we'll, we, we'll eventually get there, the inconsistency and the inequities that exist within the system. So we're maintaining internal errors to include, but we exclude those who try to come into the system with typos. And we're talking about major million dollar contracts versus maybe just entry points, right? So again, we, I, I can't sidestep certain things that are in your face. It's like, okay, wow, look how convenient we're being. It's okay for that to happen for that, but then it's such a high double standard for that. Uh, just a point to be duly noted. Um, yeah, we're good, we, we, we're good on, uh, what the committees have approved regarding uh, on demand. So you're okay. Uh, that was more rhetorical. I yield the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner uh, Robinson. Point well taken. And uh, if there are no other questions, we're going to move back to tab number seven. Ms. Thank you so much, Director Valentin, as well. We're going to move back to tab number seven authorization to renew a maintenance agreement. Uh, certainly with Doran Precision System in the amount of $9,975 for the team driving simulator and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. And I believe, Mark, you will provide an update. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Holmes having technical difficulties, uh, but I talked to him. So this is an annual agreement and there is no increase. It's the exact same as it was uh, last year. And it's just the maintenance agreement on the team driving simulator. That simple. Okay. okay. Any questions? I, I see uh, Commissioner Carthen. Thank you, Chairman Jones. Uh, Director Till, I know that this is under a dollar amount, so it didn't have to receive three, um, I guess three quotes, because it's under that amount. However, do you know if the Sheriff's Department looked at any other maintenance agreements to kind of make sure again that we aren't being overcharged like just just to make sure it's in alignment with what others are charging in regards to maintenance service because i noticed that this company is out of new york so i was wondering okay so if they're out of new york they're probably a third party vendor which means that they probably have to get someone who's here local to handle certain things so in my mind, sometimes it just behooves us just to, and I know it's he's an elected official, so he can choose whoever he wants to, uh, but you as the county administrator, if you'll just kind of reiterate to them that as we're trying to cut costs and, and make sure that we're in alignment with what the GORM fees are, that they, they kind of take a look at that. It's just a yes, suggestion. No, <laughs> this is, I mean, this is a renewal, so I'm yeah. assuming they did not this year, but they would have in the past. Uh -huh. um, but no, I'm assuming they did not this year, but I don't know for sure, but because um, okay. this is an annual agreement and there's no increase. So it's the same as it's been for the past couple of years. Okay. But again, do you, do you see where my concern lies in, in regards yes, to, 
Okay. All right. So I just wanted to put that out there, but thank you so much for that. Madam Chair, I yield the floor. Okay. Thank you so much. We're going to move on to tab number 10. Tab number 10 is authorization to amend the election provisions of the ACCG Retirement Services Plan Agreement for certain elected and appointed officials as class four employees and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Perry. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, Madam Chair and Board of Commissioners. Wanted to follow back up with this item uh, that was tabled from the last meeting. I did get an opportunity per our discussion to uh, follow up with each of the commissioners just to kind of uh, do a, a deeper dive into this uh, item. I've also invited uh, Paul Bates, the uh, uh, our region uh, manager for uh, ACCG uh, Retirement Services to join us on this call. I would like to call on Paul right now just to uh, to give a recap, an overview of, of this line item and uh, and and kind of uh, give some uh, some points about it, and then we can uh, we can Bobby. go, Madam Chair. Is now exiting. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, thanks, Frederick. Uh, the, the documents uh, again, as the Chair said, uh, is allowing in-service retirement uh, for cer certain uh, elected officials as Class Four. Uh, employees. Um, this uh, change would not create any unfunded liability, no increase in costs by itself. Uh, the actuaries are currently um, doing evaluations to allow for a targeted retirement at age 65. And so the, because the plan document does not change the age, it will not create any unfunded liability. And okay. And Madam Chair, I just, uh, you know, wanted to come back. I know that we wanted to have some individual conversations uh, surrounding this uh, this proposed amendment. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll, I will yield to any questions that uh, you or the commissioners may have. Okay, thank you so much. I, I see you, Commissioner Guider. Commissioner Guider. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, um, and I did receive uh, an email from a previous employee um, the rank and file employees that qualify under this, are they excluded? Um, uh, Madam Guider, this would be uh, specifically for class four employees, so would not apply to rank and file employees. So a fireman that is, or, or a deputy that is 65, and they qualify under the same criteria that these class four employees are, are qualify, they cannot do this, but the elected officials can. Is that right? Yes, whoever falls in that class four category, this would apply to them, uh, but it does not cover uh, firefighters or anyone that is uh, that's not elected. That's correct. Uh, is this d discriminatory? Paul, I, I, I'll yield to you, Paul. Yeah, just, I, why just class four is what I'm saying. And I, I, I didn't think about this until um, someone brought it to my attention uh, that they have to retire by 2021 to keep from, from losing their back pay and everything. So is this, uh, why does it exclude employees that fall under the same criteria as okay. the class four employees? Okay. Madam Chair, uh, Madam Guider, I'm thinking that we're talking about two separate issues that you just mentioned. Uh, you mentioned okay. uh, December 31st, 2021. That's the sunset clause for the uh, sick leave retirement bonus. They wouldn't lose anything. Uh, there would just uh, be the end date for those funds to be calculated in their retirement benefit. So that's one item. Uh, the other item would be what we're discussing right now as far as the amendment to allow in-service uh, distribution of retirement funds to class four employees. Uh, yeah, the class four employee, uh, uh, it does streamline this benefit to focus on uh, particular uh, particular uh, elected officials, uh, and it would not be um, available to, like you said, rank and file employees. Uh, Paul, if you would, uh, you, you, and, and we talked about this, we talked about 
the availability of this particular benefit uh, to um, regular employees versus uh, specific classes. Could you speak to that? Well, it's certainly permissible under the plan. Um, the board would have the uh, ability to do that. Uh, the question um, I heard earlier was, was it discretionary, discriminatory, excuse me, um, that would be a question for your legal department as, from a personnel standpoint. But regards to the plan, uh, the IRS uh, says it is permissible to allow in-service retirements, again, only at normal retirement age. Uh, any earlier than that um, is not allowed by regulators. Only those that reach the age 65. Um, and they can't go ahead and retire and receive their benefits and then continue working. Uh, currently, your plan does not allow for an in-service retirement. This document that's before you would change that and allow for an in-service retirement, normal retirement, only to elected officials, if you voted to make this change. Well, um, uh, the director and I, we talked about this and, you know, I didn't really have any problems with it until someone pointed out it does not apply to everybody. It just uh, a class of uh, people. So um, I don't know if we should look at uh, going forward. Most pe people retire before 65, I would assume. But what if they don't? <laughs> Mm -hmm. and we're treating them differently than we are elected officials. So I, I think it's something that uh, merits uh, some uh, further conversation going forward. I guess we could, if we amended this today or tomorrow, just on the class four employees, we could go back and look uh, at a, another time about rank and file people that fight, that uh, turn 65 and continue to work. That, that's correct, Madam Goddard. We could go back and review uh, the full impact of, uh, of, of allowing uh, this benefit to be accessible to all employees. We could look at that, uh, that impact as well. We could come back uh, and, and certainly make that change at a future, at a future date. Well, nobody likes to break out a class of people on anything. And so uh, we, we might need to have further conversation going forward on the rank and file employees that continue to work okay. and um, where they could drive their employment because uh, their um, retirement, because they do not get to retire twice. Uh, is, that, is that correct, Director? You said that they could not retire. Uh, if they took their benefits now, they could not again take those benefits when they right. actually quit work. Right, that's correct. So, so if this is approved. They could retire uh, and continue to work, but there would be no service uh, or there would be no um, uh, uh, what, what, what's the word I'm looking for, Paul? There would be no increase they, in benefits. They, were, they would accrue no additional benefits under the plan once they initiate their benefits. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it, if there's no cost to us for the Class 4 employees, it should be no cost to us, any further cost to us for rank-and-file employees, right? That is a good assumption, uh, probably a correct one. Um, I did not ask that question specifically uh, to the actuaries, but uh, I will certainly do that as a follow-up. All right, thank you. And I, I yield back, ma'am. All right, thank you so much, Commissioner Guider. Uh, if there are no other questions from the board, yes. I'm gonna move, move. No. okay. Oh, <laughs> uh, Vice Chair <laughs> Yeah, I, I can't let this one go. All yeah. right, I can't see you. Yeah, it, this, you know, I, I appreciate Madam Guider's point about class four, and, and to that to to our, to our citizen, this is this is what they call golden parachutes um, that that get created along the way if you're not paying attention. Um, they happen in um, executives and private companies all day long, uh, where uh, there's certain compensation and benefits that are extended based on certain classes. Uh, it's nothing new. Uh, it's something that happens all the time. This one just happens to land on our watch. 
Um, I, I was not aware, nor did I drive this one. Obviously, I'm not going to be eligible for this um, at, at all. Uh, my question becomes if, if this was considered part of our overall compensation. So is this considered compensation, um, Director Perry? Well, uh, from the standpoint of retirement, uh, retirement would be considered uh, in the full compensation package. So yeah. I would have to say, yes, it would be. Yeah. All right. So and this is sort of where we as board commissioners, here we are. I'm, I'm going back to consistency. So this thing is before us, and we're included in that class for employees. And we're voting on something that gives us direct benefit. I'm just going to deal with us. I'm, I'm not going to deal with anybody else as it relates to um, any other elected or appointed official, nor am I really concerned about the rank and file. I think the argument was made and, and, and duly noted, um, Madam Guider. Uh, but I, I, I looked at how this was framed. It's like, okay, now why are we in this? I don't hear no objections from people saying it, it's interesting how we're we'll push something out there for two hundred dollars in compensation, make it such a big deal. And we try to smooth stroke this one. This is compensation. Like, look, it's a whole class of look at this. That's my problem about systemic inconsistency. Uh-huh. Right? All we went through, and I don't hear anybody yelling from the sideline. Um, about what this would mean. Still compensation, right? Right. It, it, it's that, and it's that awareness that 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 why I sit here and say, okay, really. So now I've got to sit here and vote on something that, okay. On one hand, we went through three, four months of all oh, this two hundred dollars for expense account, but then here we we about to spot a whole class of citizens, a whole class of us. About to deal ourselves in to a golden parachute. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I see. See? And and so that's uh-huh. And so the question becomes, not could we do this? It's should we do this? And and again, I don't know who's on the list that, that will qualify this on any time in the in the near future. I mean, again, I don't, so I can. I'm pretty neutral on how this would flow out. I, I, I don't have a lean one way or another. I'm making a, a very obvious point uh, about how we apply policy, right? And it's gonna be consistent with this, right? So here we are now, um, just like Madam Guider, um, should we, uh, I, I see that we're, uh, should give consideration to rank and file. So I guess my question is, do we take the board of commissioners out of this? Uh, uh, at, because we're voting on ourselves. I mean, I don't know. Did we require? Did we need a public hearing? Did we need to? I mean, I, 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 now this may be part of a plan that we've already blessed, so therefore it gives you certain exceptions and provisions. But I, I'm just looking how uh, there's no no concern about the board of commissioners are dealing ourselves a parachute, and nobody's saying anything. But we pick and choose what we want to highlight. But I get it. It's okay. Um, I'm not certain where I am on this going into tomorrow. Uh, like I said, I'm, I, I'm not, I don't have a position per se um, um, on, on the merits of, of it. And if somebody has earned it, I have no problem with that. I, I won't get into that. I'm, I'm, I'm at, my job is to focus on policy and I'm just going to stay in my lane. So with, with that statement being said, I'm going to yield the floor and I'll reserve the rest of my commentary for tomorrow. Thank you. I'm good. Thank you so much, Commissioner um, Robson, and I see you, uh, Commissioner Carpenter. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. I just have one question for Director Perry. Can you tell me how many, um, I guess, individuals that this will directly impact, and if any of the Board of Commissioners, because I kind of hear where Commissioner uh, Robinson is going, and I don't want it to look like we're trying to deal ourselves in. I mean, clearly, I am nowhere near 65, so that it wouldn't benefit me anyway. But uh, but I do want to know uh, what what's the number? What what are we looking at in terms of numbers? Well, roughly uh, the individuals, the number that would qualify would be about 18. Uh, 18 uh, elected officials would fall under Class Four employees. Uh, not all of them would qualify for, uh, immediately qualify for this benefit. I think it's about maybe six or seven of them that would immediately, uh, are immediately eligible 
to uh, to uh, um, uh, qualify for this benefit. So uh, so that's what we're looking at. We're looking at roughly about 18 total, and uh, seven would immediately qualify for it. Got you. So it's they can elect to take it or not to. That's Is that correct. correct? That's okay, correct. So it would be up to the individual. Uh, it just wouldn't be automatic. That's correct. Okay. And and Mr. Bates, to you, you said this would be no impact on us financially. That is correct. Uh, the, the benefit at age 65 is assumed to be fully funded. That's what the actuaries are. That's the roadmap they're laying out for you to get those dollars in to that um, plan at that age. So okay. because you're not changing the age, you're not changing the course. The course. Okay. Clear enough. All right. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I yield the floor. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner Carter. And those were some great questions that you had uh, for um, certainly Fred and then also Paul Bates. All right, with that being said, uh, Board of Commissioners, you have the information and certainly you, uh, we will uh, move uh, accordingly with the vote tomorrow. Let me move on to tab number 11. And tab number 11 was an authorization to execute a professional services agreement with Lionheart Consulting Group to facilitate leadership and diversity training as authorized the chairman to sign all related documents. I have really, I, I read it out loud, but we're going to place this one on hold because all the BRR's budget improvement requests are on hold at this time, but certainly uh, definitely um, uh, very uh, in favor of facilitating leadership and diversity training. It's just right now we don't have anybody in the building. Everything is kind of real at, at a standstill. But Fred, so I'm asking if we could just, I would like to bring this one back, okay, at a future date. And it, it could be sooner than later. Just want to make sure, okay? okay. All right. Uh, because all the other BRRs on hold, and I got them all on hold right now, and it would just be unfair to really move forward with this. So I'm gonna move on, Board of Commissioners. I see Commissioner Robson. You have your eyes. I see you. What's yeah, going yeah. on? In your, and you well, know, I may I? Yes. Yes. Sure. This is where, um, I, I, and I, I, I allowed Madam Carthen to drive the whole conversation regarding the resolutions. Um, that tends to be her sweet spot. But I'm gonna go back to the hate crime. Mm -hmm. All right. Now I'm gonna go back to the need for diversity. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go back to need. Like, but what are we doing at the local level to make change? Okay. It's great that we embrace the state and what they're doing and go Congress, but what are we doing as elected officials to ensure that we're translating that at a local level? This is when we're directly saying, we're talking about training. So we adopt a resolution that the state says, hey, we need to, to focus on these, 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 these areas. Mm -hmm. Like, but yet here we have a chance right here to. Uh, to ensure that, to translate that within this administration as if it's exempt from what's happening in the broader world. And I'm like, okay, why are we pausing on something that we're, on one hand, we're saying one thing, but then we're, again, we're not focusing on what we need to. It's essential. This is not a non-essential. That, 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 that hate crime, it was like, no, we got to do this. It's not a, oh, it's a nice to have type of training. This is real. What do you think the protests are going on out there? It, it, like we can't live in a bubble. It, it's too. It's too serious. It's too serious for us to sit here and say. And we just we sidestep that. And that's what I, I just. We we we. I I'm going to allow what would happen. We can always revisit because we're talking about it. Uh, but I, I think we're missing a, a moment here. How on one hand are we going to talk about what the state? Yeah, we're getting behind them riding their coattails. But it was time for us to put our take a position and be serious about no and, and even in our house, this is important. I, I just I think we're missing something here by pausing on that. You don't have to be in the building. I believe that this was all about remote training um, that allowed us to facilitate this, and the timing is now. But okay, I but duly noted. Uh, I, I just think that uh, when we advocated for this last year, we thought we, even during last year's budget, we knew it was important. Mm -hmm. Now, in light of a six months later, in light of pandemic, in light of protests, it's even more important. Mm -hmm. yeah, like, no, you you got to take time out. I mean, everybody's remote. Everybody's not everybody. Most people are remote. Oh, you you ain't in traffic no more. How, I mean, how? I mean, it ain't like real pressure is being put on our employees per se. So you got time for training. You you if if this is important, or are we just sort of 
smiling and going through the motions. So it's just something I'd like for us to at least consider. I know it's on the work session agenda. I know it's been asked to pull off. Uh, if, if my peers agree with that, then that's fine. I yield. But it's something I think we're missing something. On one hand, we're going to pass a resolution to, to embrace hate crime, but yet we don't translate into our own local policy something to, to, to ensure education training, even from our leadership. In other words, what y'all need to do that over there, public safety. Yeah, that's good over there, uh, over there in judicial. But as it relates to the administration, basically the White House, oh, no, we're good. We, we don't need to do that here. I have a problem with that. I, I, I just... I think it's something at least that needs to be considered. But okay, I get it. Go ahead, Madam Chair. We got to get through this agenda. I yield. Thank you. Certainly, I want to. I want to certainly uh, tab number eleven, and, and I agree with that. Certainly, I appreciate Commissioner uh, Carthen bringing forth the rate uh, the resolution on racism. Certainly, I've taken the initiative for the hate crime, and certainly, uh, again, when I certainly wanted to pull it off as a BRR, I wasn't looking at the entire moment of uh, certainly the situation we're dealing with in terms of just the moment. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more, uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, at this time because of the situation. Certainly, I'm saying we still are not in the building, but that has nothing to do because we do have access to technology. Uh, Fred, this is something that we talked about when I first came on board, um, this right. Lionheart. We've been talking about Lionheart forever. Why did it take, number one, so long to get it here? I've been talking since 2017 about Lionheart. What happened? And certainly, is this something that I will allow the Board of Commissioners? We need to, we can discuss it and move it forward because the time is now. But, and also, can we talk about the impact? It's, it's a BRR. What is the impact? But what's, and it certainly doesn't matter because the impact overall will be allowing this country to move forward. And that's what we need to do. Tell me what the impact is, number one. Mm -hmm. Total amount uh, uh, that has been approved for this training is fifty thousand dollars. Okay. And that is what the uh, agreement is is currently written for. Mm -hmm. uh, agreement is currently under uh, legal review, but the total amount uh, to your question would be fifty thousand dollars. Okay. And um, and then we've been waiting since twenty seventeen. Why was it? Did did it take so long? Because I've been. Well, this I don't, is not it, it, and Madam Chair, to my understanding, it's not been since 2017. We just put that in as a BIR for the budget, this 2020 budget. But I've heard Lionheart before with the name. But anyway, make a long story short, we will move forward with this tomorrow because it makes sense. And uh, certainly, again, I was just, again, trying to stay in the, leaning on the wall of BRRs are not approved. But it, it, at the time and moment, it makes sense to move forward. So we, we will move forward. Any any comment on this particular item, Board of Commissioners, is tab number 11. Let me read it again to make sure that you hear it loud and clear. Authorization to execute a professional services agreement with Lionheart Consulting Group to facilitate leadership and diversity training and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final mm -hmm. legal review. And In Madam, Madam Chair, if I may, I do have uh, Lionel Savage uh, on the on the line as well. He was going to just kind of give a brief overview of uh, the Leadership 150 training as uh, as it's been dubbed. Uh, since I have him on the line, I you know would ask if he would be allotted a few minutes to yes. kind of talk about and uh, you know give some insight as to what he has in store for uh, for Douglas County in terms of uh, diversity and leadership training. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Lionel. Would love to hear from you. This is a perfect perfect storm, at, uh, for lack of a better term, and would love for you to chime in and tell me what this would do for the county, and I'm excited about the diversity training. So if you could proceed, Mr. Lionel. Let's see there. Fred, we can't hear him. Let me see here. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I assume my camera is also working. You don't mm -hmm. see me? No, I, don't. I saw you earlier, Lionel. You may. Uh, maybe it's because. Uh, uh, well, there you go. Great, great. Good afternoon. No, uh, we don't. See, we, we still don't see you, Lionel. Try uh, one more time. You see me now? Uh, let me see. Yeah, I don't know why. Well, Not your voice, happy. your voice will work as well. Yeah. All right. Well, I see, I see everyone else. Good, good, good afternoon. Thank you for an opportunity. Uh, it's been, it's actually been an education to sit 
hear and listen uh, to, to the civic matters uh, being led by this great commission uh, at the meeting today. I want to briefly talk to you a little bit about what we'd like to do uh, with the, the leaders of Douglas County. We're calling this Leadership 150 and mm -hmm. com commemorating the 150th anniversary of Douglas County. Um, we've really broken this down into three uh, parts. There's a pre-engagement part where I was going to spend time with each one of the commissioners to talk about what we're going to do in detail to get any last minute feedback from you. I was also going to spend time uh, with the county administration uh, leader um, and then also meeting with those department heads uh, that uh, Director Perry uh, has selected to be a part of this engagement. Uh, in that pre-engagement activity, we're also going to do a Myers-Briggs uh, type indicator assessment mm -hmm. and a Gallup Strength Finders assessment uh, to really get a really good sense of where your current leaders are, understanding their personality types, understanding what their strengths are. And then that would lead us into what I'm calling our Leadership 150 curriculum. Um, and I'm able to send this information to any of the county commissioners to read at their leisure um, at, a later, at a later point in time. But if I were to go through the, the major points of the Leadership 150 curriculum, you know, we're really looking at uh, four main things that we're going to cover. Leadership and influence, mm -hmm. leading through change. Uh, you know, change is everything for everyone uh, in public service right now. When you look at the leaders for Douglas County, the different departments that they lead, leading through change is critical because every day uh, they are doing something that's dramatically different than what they were just six months ago. And then also leading a diverse and inclusive culture. And so, um, you know, with that, those three, uh, those three parts of the curriculum that I just mentioned are a total of eight hours um, in instruction period that myself and my five-member team will take part in. We also have added, because of our virtual solution, uh, mm -hmm. Madam Chair, you know, I was going to be there in person, but because of our uh, virtual solution now, we've also added a women's leadership panel um, and additional executive coaching post-engagement uh, with 20 of your uh, 20 of your department heads uh, pre-selected uh, or selected during the time of our curriculum. Uh, the additional coaching that we're going to do uh, would be three coaching sessions per uh, per department head, uh, three 45 minute sessions over the course of six week time period. And if I may, uh, to to tell you about the team that I'm going to include, uh, that's going to be working with me. We have a total of about 170 years of leadership experience. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I have very senior people who have had leadership positions in, in government, private industry, and we have a very diverse uh, leadership team made up of two men and three women uh, from all over the U.S., including uh, someone that's from Georgia, Susan Roma, who is um, going to be fantastic on a women's leadership panel. Uh, I'm going through this very quickly because I know you guys have lots of business to take care of, um, but I'm open for any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, uh, Lina. That was a great um, segue into just, uh, again, thank you for reminding myself about this virtual uh, solutions at this time. Certainly, I'm, uh, I've had a pl plethora of diversity training in other organizations prior to arriving to a uh, county government and certainly would like to see this infused here and it's been very beneficial and love what you just mentioned about leadership and influence and leading change that's because we are always managing the unexpected uh, and who moved my cheese and all those things that are needed as we mesh this melting pot of diversity together uh, in county government and also wanted to allow it to spread beyond just the doors of Douglas County. My question to you, Lina, will, will this, uh, this now, because it's, it's virtual, would we have an opportunity for it to be Facebook Live so our citizens could look in on it? Because again, this is changing culture from the inside and outside, from both internally and externally. What can we do? Is that a possibility? Because I'm excited now. And I thank you again, Vice Chairman Robinson, who just sparked my interest again, because again, I was leaning on dollars and the time, but the time is right right now for this to move forward. So will the citizens have an opportunity to, to look if it's, I mean, they may not be able to chime in, but could they be able, would they be available to, to attend some of the classes if it's Facebook Live, or can you explain that to me? So, so my first answer to that is, I am so excited by what you just asked me. 
um, because it tells me that you understand um, the larger impact that this could make. We, you know, we've been focused for a couple of years on the department leadership. If we thought that we had an opportunity to make a broader impact to your citizens of Douglas County, I, I'm more than excited. What I can't tell you is, is that I don't know how to, you know, I'm not sure how we do it on Facebook Live. Um, I have a technical team that's working with me. If you give me, uh, you know, if you give me 24 hours, I can come back and give you a response. I've already had meetings with uh, the technical folks from Douglas County just on being able to provide a very robust and intuitive session inside of Microsoft Teams in which we're going to be doing online polling. We're going to be doing uh, virtual breakouts. Mm -hmm. We're going to be doing everything um, to make sure that people are engaged and not just looking at some funny looking guy through a computer, you know, mm -hmm. for two or three hours. Uh, just to give you even more uh, impact of what we're going to do, we're, we're, we're going to do all of our instruction in bite-sized nuggets. So we're going to be doing micro instructions, meaning that every 12 minutes we will do something different during the course of our instruction because we do understand uh, what it takes to keep someone's attention looking at a computer you know in their dining room somewhere in Georgia and a person's talking to them 600 miles away so we have uh, so many things that we're working on to make sure that it's an engaging activity so to add in other folks uh, from the county via Facebook live or some some other way to do it I'm wide open to that. I think my team, once they hear this, will be so excited. Uh, if you can give me 24 hours, I'll send you an email uh, back to the county commissioner staff to say, here's how I believe we can do it. I just don't want to tell you, yes, we can do it. And technically, it's not possible. But I will find that out um, very quickly. OK, thank you so much. Any other comments from the board of commissioners or questions from Mr. Lionel? And I'm so sorry you guys can't see me. I, I know. I got, I got I my fancy title and everything. We saw you earlier, <laughs> so thank you. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Any comments? I see. Okay. Well, sounds pretty self-explanatory. We're excited about it. Certainly, uh, Mr. Lionel, you will uh, re respond back to me because certainly I want it to be in internally, externally, and it'll be. Uh, this is an opportunity for the entire county to capture this moment of diversity. Okay. I have one. I have one question. Uh, while we're waiting for legal review, uh, and you can see in my detailed, uh, you may not see it today, but in, in my detailed uh, offering to the county, you know, I wanted to spend some time with each one of the county commissioners. Uh, uh -huh. You know, since they're all here, if they, you know, if they still would like to do that with me, I'm willing to talk with people as early as this week. I want to try to move things along as much as possible while we're waiting for legal review. I know you all are very busy. I'm not going to hold you for a two hour phone meeting, but just to answer any more questions you have in detail, I will give you as all the detail you'd like in our one on one discussions and also with the county administrator as well. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And Director Perry, will you uh, just contact our each individual um, legislative aides for uh, and also my executive assistant? to see if we could uh, place Mr. Lionel on our, our calendars and we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Oh, okay, thank you so much. And I appreciate you again for just opening my mind. But at the time I'm looking at dollars. See, that's why it's, 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 it's nice to have two eyes on something because I'm thinking just about dollars. But right now we, we're in a moment not only about health, but we have to look at the entire moment and we do have other things going besides COVID. We have a major protest in this country going and we need to address it now. All right, let's move on to the next item. Let's the next item is tab number 12, authorization to finalize and distribute a new computer use policy for all Douglas County employees as recommended by the Technology Committee. Uh, Director Martin, uh, Russ Martin. Well, I hope this is the easiest thing y'all look at today. Um, <laughs> okay. We don't see you so, either. So the uh, that's I'm, I don't have on a fancy tie like Lionel did. So um, the the computer use policy is most people's first interaction uh, during orientation with the IT department. Uh, it is a document that describes the proper way to use our technology, expectations that we have for people when they're using technology, uh, and so. The document that had been in place had been in place for probably eight to 10 years and just needed some some significant updating uh, to bring it back up to uh, up to just modern language, if nothing else. 
So if I could, if, if that's on, he was going to cover a couple of the significant things that changed, uh, and then that'll do it. Yep, I'm Dad, here. There? Yes. Uh, so some of the biggest changes were we updated our password requirements, we made it a lot stronger. Um, so that's 14 characters, complex um, sequence, essentially. Uh, and then the thing I'm really excited about is requiring multi-factor authentication for Office 365, which is our email and Teams and uh, Word documents and such, and also through our VPN connections. So any most most of the connections from coming from the outside and to county networks, just be able to secure that and protect us. So. Um, and like Russ was saying, we're going to distribute this through electronic format, so that way you can read it through your computer and acknowledge the agreement online. So. Okay. Thank you both, Russ and Dad Lou. Appreciate your uh, presentation. Board of Commissioners, do you have any questions regarding our computer technology use policy? Yeah, sure. Uh-huh. Madam Chair. Sure, All right, so, yeah, so maybe I, 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 I might have anticipate this was something else. Um, uh, we talked about use of our technology, our computers. Um, uh, does it establish, and maybe it's, it, it's in the technology language and I may just miss it, so I'm, I'm okay with being, being wrong on this one. Um, as it relates to, for example, you said teams, and for example, um, uh, is there a protocol or standard for, for example, borders for a consistency of experience? Uh, or buffers. Is that addressed in this at all? Did y'all talk about that here? I don't think I'm really exactly understanding the all question. Right. You, you sure. didn't. You, you, all right, so it's not <laughs> here. It's not here. Uh, what, and I'm, I'm going to, for, for, for my vote and for my consideration, I'd like to see something that recently happened um, uh, by use of Teams. Right now, you see directly into my home, right? Uh, and the question is, is that if I have something that, um, may offend someone. I don't know. Let's just say it's, if I had a picture of Obama sitting in my background right now, someone who's not a fan of Obama may get offended by that. But you have direct visibility into my home. Um, and someone may ask me to remove my picture of Obama, which is, but you're in my home. And, and, so, and so there was this whole conversation that was had in, internally about, um, well, since you're using county equipment, you have to, you should remove that which is in the background. And, and so now you're getting into this whole, hold on, you're in my privacy of my home. But the simple answer was, well, well, you don't pay for my Comcast, you don't pay for my electricity per se, but but okay, I get it. And it could be simply solved by, uh, we have to coexist. If we're if based on beginning of our conversation today with Dr. Mimar, who's like, guys, we're gonna be in this pandemic for a hot minute. Right, mm -hmm. and we're going to have to do this telecommuting um, to Madam Chair's leadership, which I agree for a minute. Now I know we got slammed into this thing because again we didn't anticipate this, and we hadn't really, to your point, brought up our code, uh, brought up our policies to reflect the current times, a pandemic, and you know, ten years ago, Facebook and all that stuff wasn't. I mean, I was still my space in it. Right here we are. This thing is full throttle. A decade later, this thing is you know what it is. So and with this whole Teams and Microsoft. So the question becomes, uh, think about residential and commercial. When the two come side by side, we have what? We have buffers that are put into our code to separate the two. In other words, you got this big giant wall, this million square foot, whatever. You got this house. It needs to be a buffer. And so my question is for this right here, can, can we insert some language that says that anybody that does business on behalf of the county, whether you're elected or appointed, or a department that if you're representing the county, that there should be a buffer, uh, whatever that tool is, um, um, whatever that tool is, um, that you can put a buffer up, uh, a background as they call it, so that we can separate the two worlds. In other words, like, no, we get it. Your house is your house and no one has a right to tell you what to do in your house. No one, but you. But at the same point, we're trying to coexist. So can we, I'd, I'd like for some language, we don't have to solve it right now, um, but can we, uh, uh, and I, I have a recommendation of what it could be, but this needs to be applied immediately. In other words, it needs to be consistently across the board to Madam Guider's point earlier. Well, okay, we're gonna pick an asset class. We're gonna focus on just a district commissioner, but not all other elected officials. 
Right, back, back to the consistency. I, I, I appreciate her, 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 her thought, her mindset earlier today. Um, I'd like for some language to be inserted here. Uh, and I, again, I'll yield to my, uh, my colleagues over the technology committee uh, or perhaps the programming committee that may uh, want to handle this differently. But since we're here, um, you, know, you know me, I'm able to, to alter something right in the motion. Uh, I'd like to see something regarding uh, buffers and borders to be inserted for this adoption. Um, I yield the floor for that. Okay, um, okay. You know, I'm going to chime in right quick and just wanted to let you know that immediately, yeah, the conversation has been had, but just uh, beyond the borders of just you and I. I did have an opportunity to speak with Mark and also Russ Martin, if you're still on the line, uh, about buffers. Okay. And I was under the impression that a, a, a buffer could just be inserted from the, and knowing you, you can tell about my technology experience, <laughs> that we could just have one buffer that could be uh, seamless across the board, but it's my understanding, and and I also also did, did my research. It it would uh, the buffer has to occur on your end, uh, which is the user end. And Russ, are you still there? Because I know you researched it for me and looked at it. Are you there? Yes, ma'am. Okay, can you share that with Commissioner Robson? We did talk about it, and Mark did uh, contact you and uh, asked the question for me because I want to make that happen. But I think it was impossible. So can you chat about it? Yeah, so currently the technology within Teams does not exist for us to be able to force a background as administrative. That's uh, it, It's an option built into the client, so it can be changed uh, on the client end, which is you as the end user. Uh, and as of now, there is no administrative functions that allow us to force a particular background. Uh, so Commissioner Robinson's you know, assertion that we need to deal with it via policy is absolutely correct. Um, we do need to, you know, determine, do, do we want to stand alone policy for that or do we want to include it in the uh, computer use policy? I think it's perfectly appropriate to put it in the computer use policy uh, and to admit that it is not even in this current version that we're asking to approve. And I agree it needs to be inserted, but if you could just make sure that it's uh, also explained to the user on the other end, it's, it's, they have to make that change. So it just needs to be explicit because I agree it definitely needs to be in the policy. I'm beginning to use it uh, every time we meet, but I want to make sure that it, it explained on that end that it's not automatic. Well, and, Okay, and I, then then I guess I will, and, and somebody else can chime in, I guess, but I would, I'll just um, suggest we push this to the next agenda and allow us to make those few updates yep. and bring it back. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure you're playing. Okay. okay, yes, we'll just bring it back on the next meeting and just make sure, you know, we have a, all the language inserted. So our, hope the user will be very well informed. And the Commissioner Carpen, I see you, you have something to say. I love it because when you all appear on the screen, I know it's time to talk. Commissioner my, Carpen. My only question is, has this been reviewed by Director Perry from the HR perspective, just to make sure, or the legal team, just to make sure that all our I's are dotted and our T's are crossed? Uh, I know, you know, depending on what the uh, the severity of, um, you know, crossing the policy or not following the policy, I'm pretty sure that there are some repercussions to that. So just wanted to make sure that all of those things have happened before we sign off on it, when it whether it comes back tomorrow or at another time. Understood. It was, it was written in such a way that any enforcement of any uh, policy violations goes to the uh, department head. That way we don't get into any, you know, crossfire as far as IT trying to enforce something in a different department. Uh, so we do leave the enforcement of it up to department heads. Um, so, but so, so that's that's how we try to mitigate needing to engage personnel at, at that level. Okay. And Director Perry, I don't know if you're still on the line. Is is that good with you? Do you? That that does work for me, uh, Commissioner Carthen. Um, uh, you know if. Uh, if uh, Director Martin has said that, uh, you know, they've taken the necessary steps, you know, I can yield to him and I, I don't have a problem with that. Okay. That is all. And have, has um, Attorney Bernard had a chance to look at it yet? If you, if you know Director Martin? Uh, they have not. I can tell okay. you that has not happened. Okay. All right. Well, I look forward to the to the update of it, but I'm I'm glad to to see it coming forward and it being revamped. So thank you and and um and that y'all doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
Appreciate it. I yield, Madam Chair. All right, thank you so much, Commissioner Carthen. All right, well, we'll just uh, certainly we look forward uh, in the next, uh, our next meeting, which would be uh, the July 20th meeting, uh, Russ and that, if we could just bring it forth at that time. Okay. Yes, ma'am, we'll be ready. All right. Well, Board of Commissioners, we have one last tab, which is tab number 13, before I ask for an executive session, with the uh, acceptance of the Federal Transit Administration CARES Act grant in the amount of $2,523,816 on behalf of the Connect Douglas and amend the budget and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Watson, good morning. I mean, good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> well, the there's been a lot of conversation about the, the CARES funding uh, during today's meeting, and and I'm uh, happy to announce that a large portion of that CARES money was set aside for transit systems throughout the, uh, the country. And Connect Douglas, as part of the uh, allocation for the Atlanta region, has been awarded $2,523,816 uh, to help us through uh, this year with our various uh, COVID related expenses and issues. And also uh, fifth FTA to me was very uh, farsighted in understanding that uh, as we move forward over the next couple of years, transit agencies are going to still be recovering uh, from this. So they're allowing us to use some money, not only for this year, but in, um, a couple of years after that. And I've got a break. I'm going to try to put a, a breakdown on the screen. Let me see if I can get this done. Yes, this is how we're proposing to spend the, the CARES mo money over about the next um, four years. And one big uh, item in it, as you, as you can see, is uh, FTA and Federal Highway is going to allow us to use $1.7 million of this to fully fund the bus service 100% from May 2021 to May 22. Uh, <clears throat> so that's really going, going to help us as, as we recover from this uh, pandemic this year and, and moving forward. Um, we feel like we've really got the money allocated uh, in the best possible way for our use over the next three or four years. And uh, uh, this is going to help us a lot. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Director, Director Watson. In fact, I have a question for you. Uh, since this funding has come through, you know, typically what we could do, the Board of Commissioners, particularly as we have the Connect Douglas on our budget and as we move into our uh, budget workshop, or should I say retreat that's coming up in the next couple of weeks. So are, are you indicating we don't have to worry about bu budgeting that typically $400,000 that we've done in the past, you know, as, as we were looking forward to do every year? that match of 400,000, is that not necessary this time? Or can you explain? Well, in, in our calendar year uh, 2021, which is also the county's fiscal year, we'll have to budget a little bit of, of that $400,000, but not the full amount because the uh, the CARES fund will kick in uh, in next May of 2021 and cover 100% of the bus service from May through the end of the year. So the the local portion will be significantly lower uh, than it usually is. Okay. Okay. Uh, any questions from the board before I move on? Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Carthen. Thank you. Uh, Director Watson, how are you? I'm good. How about you today? I'm good. Uh, my question is in regards to safety. So since we have the, the CARES Act money, um, are you implementing more safety measures in regards to that since we know COVID will be with us for a while longer? Uh, yes, ma'am. That in that $210,000 amount you see for 2021, that will be uh, directed exactly what you're talking about. Okay. And what about safety as far as the drivers uh, continuing to um, educate them and, and making sure that they, they are keeping um, safety uh, on the routes, the buses, picking up patrons, safety of the the, uh, the buses themselves? Are we, are we allocating any of that towards that type of training and safety? Yes, ma'am. And, and certainly uh, personal protective equipment will be, will be part of that. Uh, 
making doing the best we can to separate the drivers from the the riders on the buses um, sanitizing the buses uh, on a regular basis uh, all of those things that we can do to not only keep the the drivers safe but the patrons as well uh, my question to you is is there a mass policy to ride connect douglas we're we do not require a mask but we have masks available um, as the, the the patrons get on the the bus the, all the driver can do is ask them if they would like a, a mask and if okay. they when we have one available for them okay so we do provide them if they if they are in need of one in order to ride the bus okay yes, and if someone gets on the the uh, connect douglas uh, bus is it automatic that the driver asks them if they see that they don't currently wear one no it's it wouldn't be automatic it would just okay. be more of a casual type thing asking if you know just, just do you need a do you need a mask would you like a mask uh certainly okay. there, there's no not going to be any pressure okay but um gotcha but we have uh actually facilitated a way that if someone got on the bus and they needed one that we would be able to give them provide that for them yes ma'am okay. and that's in incorporated in your costs sounds mm -hmm. good fair enough to me thank you so much director watson yes ma'am mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner Carpenter, and uh, thank you so much, Director Watson, for bringing the good news to us today. Yeah. We need to hear something good in our ears today. Uh, last but not least, Board of Commissioners, we have a board appointment and certainly that will require, uh, is for the Cobb Douglas Board of Health, and that is to be discussed in executive session. So at this time, uh, a county attorney, do we need to go into executive session? Yes, ma'am. We need to go into executive session for litigation and is now for exiting. Personnel. Okay, you said okay. All litigation right. And personnel. Okay, board of commissioners. With that being said, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Okay. Second. Second. <laughs> twins today okay Lisa, we have, figure it out <laughs> we have a motion and a second uh, uh i believe the motion was made by commissioner guider and the second was commissioner carton and then when i call your name just indicate by yes you know yes if, that you would go into this executive session uh vice chairman robinson yes okay commissioner carton yes uh commissioner mitchell henry mitchell the third okay. and last but not least commissioner guider Yes. And Ramona Jackson Jones, the chairman of the Board of Commissioners. Yes, we have a five unanimous vote uh, and the motion carries. Uh, so I ask that you log off your computers and citizens. We will be back momentarily. We have a quick uh, executive session and we will return momentarily. So with that being said, Board of Commissioners, you need to just not log off, but just click yeah. out and then you will receive a phone call. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, uh, citizens of Douglas County, for your patience uh, with allowing the Board of Commissioners to engage in an executive session. Our executive session is over. And before I end this meeting, certainly would like to yield to all of my commissioners to see if they had anything in terms of announcement or something they wanted to say to the citizens. And I'll certainly I'll close with my hammering uh, discussion of uh, certainly dealing with COVID-19. Uh, Commissioner uh, Carthen, do you have anything today? that you would like to share with the citizens. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. <laughs> yes, now. Is it? Yes, can you hear me? yes okay. we can hear you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just like to say uh, kudos to uh, all of the volunteers that Commissioner Mitchell and I had uh, this past Friday, July 3rd, as we did our uh, community food drive uh, in honor of our veterans. Uh, we had many veterans to come out. Uh, and I just have to give a special thank you to, um, to um, American Legion Post 145. Mm -hmm. Ruth and Tommy were absolutely amazing um, to allow us to use that facility uh, actually two days in a row with the delivery and the distribution. 
Uh, it was amazing. We served over 210 families. Uh, we had people who were bringing up donations for us to give. So that's how we were able to, to do that. Uh, again, <laughs> with Wellstar, uh, with um, some students out of Dahlonega that actually donated cloth masks that we were able to give um, to constituents as they came up. Uh, just the donations were overwhelming. We were able to get those out and into the hands of the community and the veterans, and uh, it was a success. So thank you, Commissioner Mitchell, for all of your help, and um, just wanted to say job well done. Thank you. And also, don't want to admit the, uh, the fact, uh, Commissioner Carthen and, and both Commissioner Mitchell, that you also pushed the importance of the census. So thank you so much yes. for that as well. Yeah. So, yeah. All you. right. Any, any other discussions from the Board of Commissioners? Yeah. Yes, um, ma'am. Commissioner Guider. Just to reiterate what I said earlier, uh, Ephesus Baptist Church is having their drive-through pantry this Wednesday from mm -hmm. 3 to 5. And uh, anyone that needs some help with food, please feel free to go. Okay? Thank All you. Right. Sounds great. Commissioner Mitchell, I see you're, you're on the screen. You have anything? Oh, no, no, no. I, kudos to what uh, Commissioner Carthen stated. So great job what we did uh, Friday. So outside of that, great job. Okay. Thank you so much um, again uh, to the Board of Commissioners. Thank you. And then also to the citizens of Douglas County. We want to continue to see what we can do to mitigate the transmission of COVID-19 in Douglas County. And if this is a collective uh, effort on all of our parts. And I appreciate the full support of the Board of Commissioners uh, supporting me uh, along with this educational uh, campaign effort and citizens uh, just stay tuned we will have a lot of information coming to you and also just some things that's just as uh, basic general reminders about not only you're wearing your mask but also washing your hands and also watching your social distancing the new buzzword today is the three w's so if you could just continue to do those and just uh, stay mindful we all will get through this together again this is a marathon and not a sprint and it's going to take a while and it's it's, it's a behavior change, and I promise you, if you find a mask that fits, you will be, you won't even know it's on your face. It's a, like a, a brand new pair of shoes. Sometimes they hurt and you don't want to wear them anymore. But if you find one that fit, uh, you love those shoes to death. So if you could just find a mask that is comfortable for you to wear, I'm highly recommending it. I know it's, uh, it's certainly not an, uh, a mandate at Douglas County right now because we are under the governor's orders. But we are just asking you if you could join us in this campaign of uh, keeping each other healthy. With that being said, uh, citizens, we, we ask again that you just remain committed and support us. And we will see you tomorrow at our uh, Board of Commissioners meeting at 10 o'clock. And thank you so much and have a great evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat>